door. Okay. And what time are you leaving? Seven. Okay, close my door. Oh, this one? Yeah. Right now? I'm going on a meeting. I'll see you. Okay, all right. Bye, Nair. All right, bye. Okay. Okay. All right, good evening. Uh, welcome to the village of Mamaronic. Uh, February 14th, happy Valentine's Day, uh, Board of Trustees work session. May I please have a motion to open the meeting? So moved. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Adoption of agenda. If you want to adopt the agenda, make a motion. So move. I second that. Will we call the roll? Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. Before? Yes. Mayor Murphy? No. Uh, old business. Enforcement of multiple dwelling law. Uh, awaiting additional information. Jerry, uh, where'd Jerry go? You want to call Jerry? I'm here. Yeah. There was a second ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, any you can myself look better. Okay. There's, there's no additional information on that? No. There's no additional information. And I wouldn't even be able to tell you what information we're actually waiting for. Yeah. Well, how's the ad hoc committee going? For multiple dwelling law? I don't have a ad hoc committee for multiple oh, dwelling sorry. law. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have rental registration. I got I got. I got uh, Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Uh, anybody have any comments on the multiple dwelling law? Or remember where we left off? Uh, yeah, the, que the question is we have a law in the books and it's not being enforced. So the question is why? That's, what, that's how this got onto the agenda. Now, I understand that there are there are sections of the multiple dwellings law that are not as strict as the unified building code. And so when that happens with other codes, you just enforce the, the strictest of, the, of, the, of whatever the conflicting laws are and keep on going. But we don't do that. So the question is why? Okay, just, may I ask, what, what, what is your assertion that we don't do that? I can't hear you, Tom. Uh, what, what what are the instances that we don't do that? I mean, what what are, what are, what are you asserting? Setbacks is one. I mean, was, this was all I laid out originally when this went on to the agenda, but sex back, setbacks was one of the larger issues here. There are other areas uh, with you know within that as well. Uh, I could address two items. So the, the first, one of the things that we uh, I've spoken with the building inspector about and what, what we're going to be requiring uh, applicants is that uh, going forward, they're going to have to provide an analysis of the requirements under the dwelling law and the requirements under the building code, kind of like you'd have a zoning schedule to demonstrate you know, how you're complying. Uh, so we're, we are starting to see that. The second part uh, is uh, you know we've recommended uh, you know, rescinding the, the section of the village code. Uh, I think what, uh, what's been asked for is an analysis of the multiple dwelling law compared to the uniform building code. That, that's a major undertaking. Uh, you know, we're talking, I think, uh, you know, something like 15, 16 chapters in the multiple dwelling law uh, in the uh, building code, uh, multiple books, multiple chapters. Uh, that, that's a significant analysis. Well, let me ask a question, Dan. If you're requiring applicants to show that they're in compliance with the zoning code and the building code, why? And part of the part of our zoning code is the adoption of the multiple dwellings law. That's then, not our zoning code. The multiple dwelling law is not part of our zoning code. I believe it's part of Chapter One Hundred and Thirty Two of the Building Code. But regardless. Okay, uh, forgive me. So if it's adopted as part of the building code and you're asking applicants to show that they are in compliance, why would they not, you not do that for that and put the burden on them to show where it is? And if there's something that is more stricter in that than in another code that they are in compliance or not, and if less, 
if it's less, they're, they're adhering to the other one, which is more, you know, much more strict. That's what we've initiated. Say again? We've initiated that, to have them provide that analysis for us. Including the multiple dwellings law? Correct. Okay, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry, I misunderstood yeah. you. So is there is there a ETA on getting the information? Or? Uh, I'll, I'll talk with the building department, but between, you know, I, I understand, I understand the time constraints, but it, it is on their agenda and they're working on it? I, yes, it is. I'll follow up with them uh, this week to try and uh, nail down a better timeline. Okay, thank you. 1B, uh, use of American Rescue Plan funds. Chair? Mayor, it would, it would be, um, it would be helpful if we had the final list from the Board of Trustees uh, with their comfort level on um, <clears throat> the items that we presented um, last month. Uh, I think, and I saw in emails that uh, uh, river gauges were going to replace the food stabilization program that the staff um, presented. I think that's a great idea. Uh, but we want to move forward with starting to develop plans for the affordable housing, which we're going to be following as far as the affordable housing grant program. We're going to be following a grant program that the New York, that New York State already has in place. Uh, the Displaced Worker Initiative, broadband infrastructure, and then continuing to, uh, to put money um, towards the sewer rehabilitation project, which um, we're already we're almost finalizing. We're almost there to finalize the second phase of that project. Um, and then of okay. course, the items that were taken off, the one item was taken off was reinstating the deferred salaries that was taken care of. That was taken care of with, with another, uh, another pot of money. Can I, so I think we're, I think Jerry wasn't here last time. And, and so I think where we are is five weeks ago, because we have it's been a long gap, we had, kind of we had gotten we made some changes and some recommendations and those were in the minutes and so they have to get put into some sort of a memo last time we talked about um seeing if we could accommodate the gauges um yeah. because um, that seemed that would give real-time information to people about flooding and um i think we were trying to explain just we can't simply just give money to people to upgrade apartments there's a whole process about how we give out money as a government and yeah. how it, right. And so I think um, what we had in the initial memo was a little loosey goosey. I mean, it was just the idea, not how we would implement it. And you've subsequently found a program that we can do it through. Is that correct? Uh, I, I thought we were talk, you talking about the affordable housing grant? Yeah, I mean. I, I, I thought we were talking about doing a program that uh, was kind of a competition and uh, a, a grant program based upon applications that people put in. Am I right, not right? But we, can't, but we can't administer it. There has to be some other group that does it because there has to be accountability for yes. how those units get, um, uh, how those units are, 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 are given, either sold or rented to people, like if there's... That, that, that's correct, but I, I thought that that was a given, and that uh, the people who were going to make applications uh, for the grant, that would be part of the, you know, as, as it were, the RFP for the grant. As far as, as, far as the grant structure, um, we talked at the staff level, of copying the New York State Home Program, which is a small rental development initiative. They're short for, um, short for, they use the acronym SRDI. Um, and if you look it up, it's pretty close to what we're looking for as far as 100% affordable housing um, development or um, creation, uh, you know, through rehabilitation. So um, the state already has a, a list of um, um, forms that, um, that we could uh, utilize or at least borrow 
um, that would allow us to create this, uh, this grant program. And then hopefully have a local or Westchester community, um, you know, take care of the actual um, construction right. or rehabilitation. I, I think what the discussion was last time also is that we are improving uh, the ideas and then the staff is going to develop plans for those ideas, but they just wanted kind of guidance. So yeah. I, I, I don't think that we have to work out every aspect of it at the end of the day, you know, it's up to them to make sure that this is something that is, you know, uh, doable and fundable and a legal use of the funds. And I think that they, they understand those constrictions. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you know, these are fiscal policy matters. So what we're asking is for a resolution that would commemorate and you know identify specifically the board's priorities, so we can move forward with developing those programs. But I, you know, I see you know, Trustee Tavor raise his hand. I know he um, advocated for uh, stormwater mitigate stormwater flooding mitigation uh, uh, at the last meeting. So I know that was another idea that was presented. I think that's why I want to kind of understand and, and get a flavor uh, with an official resolution, letting us know what those policy imperatives and uh, recommendations are from the board. Okay. Well, okay. I, let me, so if we take the $50,000 that was the food stabilization program and put that toward river gauges, all right, that, that and you know, whatever's left over, uh, I, I don't know if the broadband infrastructure of $200,000 is gonna make a dent in anything. So one of the things I thought about, and I'll throw this out, is taking $100,000 from the broadband infrastructure and putting that towards affordable housing grant, making that 200 grand, and taking another 100 grand from the broadband infrastructure and putting that towards some sort of a, a, a flood initiative that the staff can work out. So that way you'd have 150 uh, toward flooding, 200, uh, toward affordable housing, 100 toward displaced uh, workforce initiative, and four and a half uh, toward the sewer built rehabilitation project. And, and then we have another $30,000 floating around because we did not uh, use this money for the deferred salary increase. But I, and I think to your point, Dan was talking about a survey that the county is doing about a bigger broadband project. Okay. There might so be another, the, the, another way of getting broadband. Right. So I mean, we've been kicking this around for a while. I mean, I, I, can we just make you know a decision on this tonight? Just how we allocate the money, and then allow staff uh, to come up with implementation of that allocation. And that's nice alliteration. Uh, and then that could come back to us. So my proposal is 200 for affordable, 100 for displaced workforce, uh, 150 for flooding, 450 for sewer, and then you know we put the 330 thousand dollars to you know whatever the board feels that would be the best use. For. And we. I'm, I'm Dan, good. I'm good. Go ahead, Dan. Then I'll do a little. Dan, you're muted. Dan, you're muted. Hmm. Uh, I think it would be helpful if at the next work session, staff provide uh, an, a bullet outline for implementation of the con of the concepts of all four with the money allocation. And that, that would, I think, help move this along. You're not going to get the all the specifics, but I think you know, just simply saying we're going to do this for A, B, or C. We we like the concept of A, B, C, D, or whatever it is, but I think we need a little bit more information before we say that's you know let let's go forward with that. Uh, and it's to me, that, you know, I think that we talked about that at the last meeting. Um, you know, when we say affordable housing, you know, what are we talking about? And I think though, if we can have, you know, maybe four or five bullet points that you know, are the objectives of that, the same with broadband, et cetera. 
I, you know, same with river gauges, et cetera. I think that makes it a lot more meaningful. And that's what I'd like to suggest. It's following up on what you're doing. In, in some in substance, that's what I said. I, I said, you know, we give them the paths and they come back to us with how they would implement the paths. Yeah. Victor, go ahead. No, no, I think Mr. Natchez is finishing. So I'll, I'll go after him, Mr. Natchez. I think he had, he had started to say something. Oh, go ahead, Victor. All right. I think that's where the probably the different lie, the, the difference in, in views are. Let, let me try to put this as simple as I can. Uh, we typically get memos outlining an issue like happened here. Then you get feedback from the board. And what happens then is you get an update, update memo. That is, I think, what's happening here. We don't, we're not getting that update memo or that additional information like what Jerry just explained. If we have received more information on, on those affordable housing, then, then you are you get to a point, this is an iterative process, where you get to a point where you say, okay, those are the five lines and this is the price tag and this is how it will be implemented because then we'll, we'll, we can make those fiscal decisions as Dan was saying, and then we're not stuck when we have the resolution in front of us or the budget. So I do think as simple as updating this with the information so we're really comfortable and not just not just um, bound, but but yes, we do this 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 uh, tax here, and then they're going to implement it because I think the that's where the difference is. I find with, with the mayor that I think yes, the the the, the, the administration and the manager is going to implement these projects, but we really have to give them a clear guidance on how the plan is supposed to work. What's the purpose? That is probably legal. That it has you know, elements. So the iterative process is where we're not where we're where we're not finding it. I think a, an update on on where we stand uh, and how okay. it could be implemented that could really help us, and then we can nail the decision. Next, go ahead, Lou. Then I get uh, all right. Uh, <clears throat> my observation is that this is found money, and these are intractable, very serious intractable problems, and it's a drop in the bucket. So we're just we're we're um, we're going to split up some money that we've uh, that's been dropped in our laps. And we want to put it uh, where it'll do the most good. So um, I don't think we should overthink it because we're not going to fix any of these problems with this, this modest amount of cash. Uh, my question for Jerry is, does the uh, sewer need all that all that 450 that you're talking about? So Lou, the sewer, the current job that we're working on right now is uh, approximately 5.5 million, right. for, which, for which we received uh, almost... $5 million grant, but we have a significant match on that grant of 1.6 million. So if we've got 450 dedicated to covering that match in this round of funding, and then we have another 930,000 coming to us June or announced to be coming to us or announced that it should come to us June of uh, 2022 or three, which one is it, Dan? This year. It'll, it'll be received in June of this year. June of this year, we got another $930,000 problem, a good problem, but we have to deal with it. So the, the 450 plus the 930,000, if we put all of that money towards the sewer, in essence, we've, uh, we've cleaned up most of our match for this grant that we received. Then phase two of the sewer project is approximately 2.5 million. Those are another three metered areas that we're currently doing the investigation on that we're almost wrapped up on. So, the, so I guess problem, the short answer is yes, you need the money. You need the money, but, okay. but we do have an updated memo, which, and I'm sorry, it doesn't have a lot of detail and, and that's on purpose only because I had COVID during the last meeting, but Dan wrote a memo um, that we talked about a little bit um, dated February 10. And so I have some scribbled notes on that memo now. Uh, if we're going to increase affordable housing, uh, that's good, that's, 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 that clears that up. Uh, displaced worker is still something on here because it's not on the memo and it wasn't. Yeah, Victor, go ahead. I was going to just interrupt very briefly. What we can make decisions on if it's 500 or 600 once we get the information, but now putting those numbers around, okay. I think it's useful that the mayor threw that proposition out, but let's not get stuck with that because then okay. we're. We, we, okay. we, with All the right. background, we we'll be able to make let, that decision. Let, let me be clear about something. I was never saying that these numbers 
or, and, and, and that idea meant that we weren't going to have a review process on how the money is finally implemented. That was never my intent, and it actually wasn't what I said. What I'm saying is, is that they can't come up with a program unless we give them a parameter of what we're willing to spend on the program. You, you, you can't make it all nebulous. Like, and, and I, I don't know if you want to really do the broadband infrastructure. And if not, if you want to do it, fine, leave it in there and we'll just go merrily along and we'll just keep you know, doing this every time. But if, if, if the broadband infrastructure isn't something that we think is going to be effective at $200,000, uh, something that might cost you know, multi-million dollars at the end of the day, then all I'm saying is let's take that item out and reallocate that money. And that is just the decision I'm asking for tonight. So, Mayor, uh, we wrote two memos, January 6th, where we have uh, uh, several items. And then Dan uh, wrote another memo to me on, on February 10th. On that memo, based on the interpretation from the January 28th meeting, affordable housing is still something that the board yes. wants us to consider, wants to consider. Broadband yes. is on there. Displaced worker program is not on this memo. So if I'm reading both memos, it looks like it was dropped at the okay. January 28th meeting, which unfortunately I missed. And, then there's and, sewer rehab, and then there's stormwater, which was not on the original memo. Correct. And then food stabilization was replaced with river gauges, which is viable. That's that's there's that's that's an actually an awesome recommendation, and um, very worthwhile. So what I'm looking at is affordable housing on the next memo where we provide the board the details that they're looking for, affordable housing, sanitary sewer rehabilitation, stormwater and flooding issues, which include river gauges, and then is displaced worker, a displaced worker program or an initiative still something the board wants us to consider or was that dropped from the original meeting to the, the, you know, the last board meeting? If I can clarify, at the last board meeting, uh, I believe it was dropped and replaced with the river gauges. The river gauges were not lumped into the stormwater uh, issue. It was done as, and I'm in favor of the concepts that have been set forth, but when we talk about affordable housing, um, I'm not sure, you know what we're talking about. The biggest problem we have with affordable housing is most of it seems to go to the 80% level, where the biggest need is at the 40% level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're and, and we're not we haven't done that. So what I would what I would envision, uh, if if you feel that you could do this by the next meeting, is give four or five bullet points on each one of these things of what what it's accomplished in a budget. And then we can say, yeah, go do that and add, get to the specific program. We will approve the specific program. But I just don't want to say affordable housing, you know, and not have it aimed at, at what we want to accomplish. It's partnering with, you know, with firms or others as opposed to us undertaking it um, for, you know, aimed at something. You know, I would love it all aimed at 40 percent. I don't know if the entire board would go with that. So, that, so let the let the board. Those let are the, the types board, of. Program. I'm sorry. If I could, the board would decide on what percentage of affordability. But let no. me read you. If I could, just just give me an, a, a thirty seconds to read three sentences, and I just want to gauge to see if the board is comfortable with three, these three sentences. Smaller rental projects tend to generate less revenue, and are at a high risk of financial stability due to vacancy. The program that we're thinking about, which is a copying a New York State program, is designed to assist nonprofit owners of rental housing to acquire, rehabilitate, and newly construct their own long-term affordable apartments. Considerations are made to alleviate the upfront costs of applications. Does that feel like something that we can proceed with? Feels like something you would like to read about. Yes. Okay, good. 
I like yeah. it, but I would like to read about it. Okay, so good. I'm, I'm okay, good. An informed decision, but but yeah. but just an idea. Yeah. Good. Yeah, Dan. Uh, I I think that's great, but I would like it aimed at something. So it's just saying affordable. If if, if we're to, whatever the money is is aimed at eighty percent, I'd uh -huh. be right. Okay. okay, I would say that that would. That's not really a, there are a lot of programs that do that, you know, in us just to be supplementing those programs don't get us to our, our biggest need. So that that's what I'm looking. I'm, not, I'm looking for some guidance in the structure that aims at, at a certain, you know, certain things. That's what I'm suggesting. And I'm getting guidance by talking to you. Okay. Go ahead, Lou. Go ahead, Lou. I think, Dan, you'll get that when, when they come back. In other words, I, if I understand this, and I may be be uh, misinterpreting this, we're, we're asking them, you know, hey, uh, Jerry, what can you do with $200,000 in the area of affordable housing? And you yeah. come back with some proposals, and then we play with that. Is that, is that, is that about right? That's that, correct. That, that was hoping That's for. correct. At the level, yeah. at, at, and but what, but what Trustee Natchez is saying is helping us because we can get a feel of what level of affordability fills in the gap that all those other programs don't do. Sure. We can do that. You, you could write that into the grant. We're looking to reach yeah. the lowest level of affordability. That's correct. It's all fair. The grant. Bang, you're done. We can do all that. Fair. Like the deepest level, the, the, the most deeply affordable. The, deepest the most level. deeply affordable, right. Yeah. I mean, that's, the, that's the term of art. That right. works we, we got, Jerry, do you have an idea of what we need to do here? I do. I have a better good. idea. But I need to vet, I need to still, I need to still have one question answered. Do we continue to use 100,000 for displaced workforce initiative or was that dropped at the January 28th meeting? And if it was, that's fine because the river gauges were replaced, I'm sorry, food stabilization program were replaced by river gauges, which yeah. we're moving forward with. But is displaced workforce initiative still something or are we dropping that? I, I, would, I would think at this point, I would rather put the money into affordable housing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That that's that's you guys in the room. Anyone else? Yeah. Whatever whatever you want. I, I you know I I, uh -huh. I had envisioned that we were going to try and seed use use some of our affordable housing money as seed money, and the program that you're describing seems like yeah. it would do that because we can't yeah. be the affordable housing developers. We need to work with a an affordable housing. Developer. That's correct. But it's seed money and it helps them with those um, hard to find that, that hard to find money for all those upfront costs right. that they're hit with. Right. Okay. So affordable housing is 300 grand now? Uh, looks like it. Okay. And I just, and I, this is yep. like one last question. I know we have a deadline by which the money has to be spent, but can it be allocated? So oh, that... no. So we have, a, we have a deadline for the proposal, which is April yeah. of this year. It doesn't the have money. To be spent by I think I think we have four years to spend the money. Yeah, it doesn't have to be spent okay. by. So, uh, we, so because the housing is isn't going to be quick. Yep, that's correct. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Can we move on? Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, rental registration program, Jerry. You got nothing on that? So, so, Mayor, I'm working on a draft of the rental registration proposal. Um, I'll share it with. Mark and Bob uh, before the next meeting, probably a week before the next meeting, so that they can look at it and fill in all of the um, uh, all of and, and make all the corrections from my New Jersey law to my New York law knowledge. Um, and then we can get this on the next meeting for for a draft look. But it's very similar to what I created for Hamilton. So um, okay, well, you guys already have a template. So. Uh, Anybody have any questions for Jerry or not? Yeah, I do. Um, can you tell me how this changes the requirements that we already have for the for safety issues for all for all rental units? It's a new requirement. What it does is it requires us to go and inspect all rental units annually but, on a registration on a fee based registration. I understand that there's no fee-based registration at the moment, but aren't we required to do that now? No, the, no the, there's no rental. Isn't the fire, isn't the fire, the, the fire code uh, require us to do that for safety? 
No. No, there's no registration of rentals in the village. I, I understand there's no res registration. That wasn't, you know, whether they you don't pay fee. That's not my question. I thought we already are required to have our code enforcement officer annually uh, inspect uh, rental apartments. Am, am I am I miss am I misinformed in that? Not in I, this form, though. I, I think that the code enforcement officer inspects the building. He doesn't go into the apartments. Uh, and he doesn't know how many apartments there are. Uh, and you know, he'll go in, uh, make sure that there's, uh, you know, it, depending upon the size of the building, make sure that there are emergency lights, uh, make sure that there are fire extinguishers, thank God they have, make sure that they're in the hallway, in the hallway that there are uh, smoke detectors or heat detectors, depending upon what the code requires. But it, it, they don't inspect the units. We have to inspect the units to make sure that this is up to a livable standard. And so that's where we're able to get the most bang for our buck that way. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, zoning strategies to encourage and support all affordable <clears throat> housing developments. Uh, I just want to talk about one thing. Uh, two things about this tonight that uh, are really pressing. Uh, in Governor Hochul's budget, there are a couple of proposals. And just take those, let's not talk about the, the worth or the, the, the validity of the proposals, but the proposals themselves really undercut home rule and zoning. Uh, what they do is they override home rule on the issue of ADUs and they override home rule on transit oriented development. Uh, the goal or the, the, the stated goal is one that I believe in creating more affordable housing. But the ADU uh, would allow is anybody who lives in a one family zone can add an accessory unit as of right. The community couldn't stop it. Uh, I, I, I think that that's not what we want in Mamaronic. And it, it also doesn't have any uh, allowances for planning. Uh, and zoning considerations about what that would entail to the community. It would just be, this is what you have to do. But my biggest gripe with the ADUs is that it does not require that they be rented as affordable units. So if the, if the quest is to create more affordable housing, which is a, a quest that I agree with, I don't think this gets you there. And in some instances, the apartments can be up to 1,500 square feet. Now, in the village of America, 1,500 square feet is a three bedroom apartment, which is gonna rent from anywhere from 3,500 to $4,000 easy. And that's just not affordable, especially to people with two children and a husband and a wife, uh, or, or whatever your family arrangement is. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, categorize it like that. Uh, so the problem is it's in with the budget. So if the budget passes, this passes, which makes it very hard for elected representatives to vote against it because there's so much in the budget, right? And the reason they did this is because if, uh, if you're from Schenectady and you vote against, the, against this, you also have voted against, uh, you know, the uh, new sewer treatment plant in Schenectady, because that was in the budget too. Uh, so th they put it all into this catch-all budget and it's either vote up or vote down. Now I've had discussions uh, with uh, Shelly Mayer and with Steve Otis, and uh, I have voiced my concerns. Uh, I I'm supposed to meet with uh, Pete Harkham. Uh, Mr. H uh, Senator Harkham uh, has a bill 
on ADUs, which is very similar to what the, go the governor is doing. Uh, and you know, my contention is if, if we can't get it out of the budget, at least have affordability requirements built in so that it actually, you know, if, if this is a blunt instrument uh, to create affordable housing, that's actually affordable at the end of the day. Um, and and the, the other measure, the TOD measure, uh, so say you have a, an area that's got one family zone right now. You can create one acre of that area, you know, or whatever it is, buy six houses, create an acre of that area. And on that acre, you can build 25 apartment, apartment buildings in an area that's zoned for one family or two families. So, and, and, and this would be, you know, non-negotiable. It, it usurps our zoning authority. And, and I'm, I'm going to throw this uh, to the village attorney. Have I misspoken about this? No, Mayor, not, not, not to my understanding. I'm trying, I found the um, affordable housing, the ADU law. I'm still looking in the budget for the 25 uh, units to the acre, but I'm told it's there. Yeah, and, and I'm told it's almost identical. Within a half mile of a train station. Within a half mile of a train station. But it doesn't say, you know, the center line of the train station. No, right? it doesn't. It does a train station. So train station. our train station is probably two tenths of a mile. Mm -hmm. So you go a half a mile from the Rye Neck side, you go a half a mile from the town of the Maronick side, get, and, and you draw a radius around it. you got a lot of the village. <laughs> it's the village. You know, it, I understand where this is coming from. You know, this is coming from because we got places like Bedford, New York, which has four acre zoning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you very much make the argument that that four acre zoning uh, w w was created to you know, preclude people of limited means from being in that community. But you know they're using they're using a sledgehammer in Mamaroneck to kill a fly. And I think we should have more affordable housing, but I don't think that this is the way to do it because it, it, to me I don't see how it creates affordable housing. It just creates more housing. So I wanted the board to be aware of this. Uh, I, I'm going to be speaking to Pete Harkin. Uh, I, I will reach out to the governor's office. I don't know if I'll hear back, but uh, Senator Harkin's staff was very uh, solicitous today in saying that uh, Senator Harkin will call me. And he, I, I know uh, Senator Harkin a long time. And he, he's a good man, and I'm sure he's doing this for the right reasons, but I just don't think his approach will reach the goal that he wants to reach. So I just wanted to make you aware of that. And uh, Senator, I hope Senator that- Harkin, the Senator Harkin's bill, the Sen Senator Harkin's bill is just about affordable ADUs. It's not about the TOD. The TOD is in the governor's budget. Yes, yes. And that's, you know, that's- But, the, but Senator Harkin's bill has been also, you know, they, you know, the governor doesn't call it Senator Harkin's bill, but she has all of the- uh, Yes, it's very similar. I'm just saying yes. he's been a proponent of these ADUs. Yes. The TOD and, is a whole different- And Pete, whole, has been, Pete has been a proponent of that for years. So for a long this is like a new development for Senator Harkin, but now it's got real legs because the governor's putting it uh, in her budget. And, you know, the, it's, it's an election year, right? The governor is running for election. So without going out on a limb, uh, I, I would say that, you know, I'm sure there are, you know, uh, gubernatorial politics involved in this too. So I, I, I'm very fearful that this will be the first step the camel's nose under the tent to just getting rid of local zoning. And, you know, what works, you know, in Mamaroneck isn't going to work in Binghamton and it isn't going to work in, I don't know, Greene County, uh, New York, or, you know, Schenectady, you know, so it, it's, it's really, uh, could be a, a, a time bomb in this community and, and in communities like the village of America. I was on a call yesterday uh, with uh, Lorraine Walsh and with uh, Supervisor Eni, and they both expressed reservations too. What should we do? Well, I, I would hope that uh, 
we could reach out to our elected representatives and I'm going to be sending uh, an email out to the community tomorrow just making them aware of what's going on because I think that they it, it listen I understand the argument about zoning and uh, you know how, how it perpetuated in a lot of ways uh, racial and economic uh, disruption but it is what it is and we are what we are I, I also understand that the electoral college was uh, put into place to enable slavery but we still have the electoral college what happened is you know millions of people in in, in the Marin, thousands of people bought homes under a certain set of rules and that was a set of rules that they bought the home on and now they don't even have input into the rules that are going to govern their property and their neighbor's property so they should be made aware of it uh, to not be made aware of it and you know it's just not fair and you know it, i listen i could be wrong at the end of the day maybe it'll it'll bang housing prices down and you know uh, a, a a new utopia will break out but i you know, I've, I've been you know uh, alive 60 years now and, I, and it's always been my uh observation that the people on the bottom don't get help unless you really try and send a program that actually tries to help you. so I, yeah i spent a short time on the uh, westchester assembly delegation call and it seemed like the legislators from our area only want 100 percent affordable housing they may go for the 20 unit per acre as long as it's 100% affordable housing. Um, they may go for the accessory dwelling, as long as it's 100% affordable housing. I think that's what they were pushing. Yes. There were some housing advocates who didn't care about the 100% affordability, and they were really giving them a, a, a hard time. But anyone but, speaking about 100% affordability, they were, they were um, you know, they were agreeing with. Bye -bye. But I think if you're talking about ADUs and you're talking about 100% affordability, uh -huh. that's pretty self-limiting because it requires an individual homeowner to tie their property up with a federal program. Yeah, wow. Or a state program. Mm -hmm. um, well, in perpetuity. All, all, so it, all, renters, all renters in Westchester County are required to accept Section 8 it's already but, it's already kind of the law that uh you know you can't refuse somebody in westchester county based upon that that they're getting help absolutely but if you enter into an arrangement by which you go through a, a formal process for building an adu under these proposed laws then you would also be renting out your affordable unit through um, like the town of Mamaronix agency. So I'm just saying yeah. that's a, it's a, it's a, it's not um, it's not just like having a two family house and you put the put it on the market and see who comes. It's a it's a more formal process. Well, yes, um, and, and I, I think that that's a process we should go through because what's going to happen now is every time somebody wants to sell their house, they're gonna add an ADU. I mean, even if they don't want it, even if they don't want it while they're living there, it ups the price of the house. You're now selling a two family house. Why not add it and get, you know, you, you put a hundred grand in and get 200 grand out. It's just, you know, it's, it's basic economics. And, and if I figured it out, believe me, there are people a hell of a lot smarter than me who, who are going to, you know, really know how to do it. Uh, so, I, listen, I, I just, I, I think that this is very dangerous for us, and uh, you know, I, I, I implore anybody who's listening or anybody on the board to please reach out to your elected officials and let them know how you feel. Uh, and I, I think it, you know, it, it behooves us to at least say you know you got to give us time to think about this at least you know and here it is 
you know, it's almost the end of February and this could be law April 1st. And it's a mighty big change. So that, that's my two cents on that. Trustee Natchez, do you have somebody here from a community refrigerator? Yes. Uh, Dan, uh, uh, Dan um, Sauterer. Sauterer is uh, in the uh, waiting room or whatever, uh, as a, a, you know, the public yeah. attendee. Got him? Promote the panelists? Yeah, promote the panelists. He's up. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hi thank you so much for, for allowing me to speak today. I'll keep it short. Um, yep. Thanks for uh, giving me the pleasure. So let me just pull up. I just had a couple... Uh, remarks to make. So um, my name is Dan Zouder. I'm a former Mamaroneck resident um, from the age of two and a half to the age of 18, um, 11 Avon Road, and I'm a proud graduate of Murray Avenue School, uh, the Homics, and Mamaroneck High School. And I currently run a nonprofit called the Mott Haven Community Fridge Network that I started at the height of the pandemic when I was a Bronx middle school teacher. Our goal is to get fresh food to families that other kinds of food assistance don't reach. We distribute produce through a network of volunteer drivers who make deliveries of rescued produce and other food essentials to community refrigerators, sidewalk public access friendly fridges filled with free food available to neighbors in need, operating under the guideline of give what you can, take what you need. Um, since the start of the pandemic, I've been lucky to have received the support of many local residents who've lent their time and their minivans to distribute food to communities in need. In fact, as of the last count, we have over 200 volunteers from Larchmont and Marinick in our database that have already uh, signed up to work with us. And it's been a great way to reconnect with my hometown. I think it's a testament to the strength of civic service and democracy in Marinick. It's refreshing to see such thriving civic service during such a trying time. And given the recent impact of the hurricane on Marinick and the degree to which community resources like the CRC have been stretched thin, a number of volunteers have suggested that putting a community fridge in Mamaroneck might be a nice way to provide emergency food relief, provide sustenance to many struggling families, and galvanize even more community members in the fight against food insecurity. And I know that organizations like the LM Hunger Task Force already do an incredible job of serving our community. And I'm also confident that we could help partner with existing um, organizations like the LM Hunger Task Force to help them do even more to serve the community. I'm also confident that an initiative like this would help galvanize community members in a new way in the local fight against food insecurity, grassroots by nature. I think that local families, religious congregations, we just had a day of service with Larchmont Temple. We have another one coming up with them soon. The Homics just came out every single Saturday to our Bronx parking lot in February, and they're coming out in the next two Saturdays in February as well. Um, schools, youth groups, restaurants, and the like, I think, would be thrilled to come together in service of this cause. Um, we've already worked with so many different organizations in the town. I can, we even did a community fridge painting into Chico's and another one outside of the Grange. Um, I can only imagine how much this engagement would increase if we were to consider putting a community fridge within the community itself. We'd be able to greatly expand upon the beautiful impulse for civil ser civic service that already exists and is carried out every day in Mamaroneck. While many community members have already volunteered with us, I just wanted to take the opportunity to formally introduce the initiative to the Board of Trustees. Um, in particular, I'd love suggestions about potential locations. Location is a very important factor for a successful community fridge projects. Um, ingredients that can help success are high foot traffic, high visibility, easy access to those in need. Another important ingredient to consider is built-in volunteer support or placing the fridge in an organization that already benefits from a high number of engaged volunteers. Some community members have suggested that a great location might be the Mamaroneck Firehouse. Um, I wondered what the Board of Trustees thought of that location idea, or if you had any other suggestions about the best way to introduce a proposal for a location. Um, to close, I'd be extremely grateful. I already am extremely grateful for allowing me to speak today and also for just the spirit of civil service that's produced amazing volunteers for our organization, over 200 to date, and its open-mindedness to considering novel approaches like this one 
for combating longstanding issues such as food insecurity. I know that a community fridge would be a wonderful way to reach more people in need. And I'm so thrilled that I get to speak about launching this project in my hometown. So if anybody has questions or anything of that nature, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Uh, my email is dan, that's D-A-N, at Mott Haven Fridge, M-O-T-T-H-A-V-E-N, F-R-I-D-G-E, M-O-T-T-H-A-V-E-N, F-R-I-D-G-E.com. My phone number is 917-497-2514. And I'm very much looking forward to the discussions and collaborations that might emerge from what I hope is the start of an extremely fruitful dialogue. Um, I also do, I think, have other people um, listening in if you want to call, if you want to hear some testimonials from other people. If not, it's all good. Um, and happy to answer any questions from anybody who has them. Um, uh, th thank you very much for your presentation and thank you very much for your volunteer efforts. Uh, I did talk to the Large Mountain Maritime Hunger T Task Force about this. And honestly, they did have reservations. Uh, so I, I would suggest that you reach out to them and you know, talk to them about their reservations and how we can possibly get past that. Or because you know, I, I wasn't able to tell them you know, as, as articulately about your program as obviously you can. Uh, so I would suggest that you, you reach out to them and uh, see if, if, if we could work in tandem with them because that would make it a lot easier. And also reach out to the Community Resource Center because they might have a, a good idea about location, especially when they're back up and running. Um. Uh, I've talked to the Community Resource Center, and Randy is very much in favor of this project, uh, as are many others in uh, the area. Uh, it has been very successful in many communities. Uh, I think it augments the food pantry. Uh, it does not uh, replace anything. Um, and I, it, this, this would be available 24-7, uh, and people can, can bring what they want when they can and take what they need when they need it. I think it's a great approach to life. I think what, you know, um, I think the firehouse is a great, is a great area, uh, uh, when, particularly when it's restored, but it, it should be in an area that's visible and easy to get to. I think Dan outlined that. Um, I think Dan can reach out to, uh, you know, uh, Large Romantic uh, Task Force, but I think the concept is something that we should be backing and we should try and be helpful to be implementing. Um, it, it's, you know, it has been proven to be significantly helpful to people in numerous areas. And I think that's this is the type of thing that is, uh, you know, a very uh, easy thing to implement and doesn't require a, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of work. No, I, I'm not against it at all, Dan. Uh, I just. Uh... And I also encourage you to speak to the Large Mountain Mariner Hunger Task Force uh, and state your case as eloquently as you just did uh, and listen to their concerns, uh, you know, because, you know, this is what they do. And, uh, you know, that they are obviously a stakeholder here. And uh, I, I, I think, you know, they, they'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, but uh, Dan, uh, Mr. Zaruda, I, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure we'll, we'll continue this conversation in the future. And uh, thank you. What do you teach in the Bronx? So I was a teacher in Mott Haven. It's the poorest congressional district in the U.S., or at least it was as of a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. And I was teaching there until recently. I left my job in August to do this full time because I felt that I could serve my students better by making sure they had full tummies because you can only pay attention to a Zoom screen so much when the rumbling of your stomach is too yeah. loud to pay attention to the lesson in the classroom. That is, that, is, that is a good point. Thank you very much. I, I think somebody else's you. hand is, is up, but I don't know. Trustee, thank, thank, you, Dan. thank you. Thank you, Dan, for noticing. Uh, my, my question. Uh, yes. Do you partner with other municipalities? Because we do. Yeah, yeah we, we actually. Be... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. That's well, well we, we just launched um, a, a partnership in, in collaboration with Council Member Kevin Riley and with the River Bay Property Management in Co-op City. Um, it's the largest community. It's the largest housing project on the planet. Um, yeah. And they're able to have a community fridge. So I do think that that a, a village like Mamaronic would also be able to have a thriving community fridge. We do it in partnership with the council member, with with the property management um, and with other with lots of other institutional forces. Right now, we're partnering with uh, 
Central Synagogue and with Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church to think about putting a community fridge in Midtown Manhattan. Um, so I do think that there's a lot of buy-in for this, uh, for this um, idea. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. No, so the question yeah. so public, but this is the only public body you think you're trying to work with. The for public bodies, you know, we, we need to figure out how, how our partnership would work because uh, yes, I, that's what that my first question was. If you've done it before, that would be useful. The second one is- We haven't done you, it with the board of trustees like this before, no. This or is a municipality terrible. or- The second question is, other than location, what, 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 what are you looking for really? from the municipality because there are other partners, but that's key. Lo location is, is the biggest thing, is, is, is the buy-in and, and, and support of, of a location that would allow for electricity hookup and high visibility um, would, be, would be our ask of, of the village. Okay, that's very useful. Thank you. you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. We, okay. there, there are ways around the space, space um, things the village can do. If we have a village attorney, of course, I'm not gonna, but we, we've dealt with, uh, you know, space, uh, using space and that, if it's more than that, then that requires other partners. So I think we'll continue this path. Thank you and, and congrats on, the, on, on putting this effort together and keeping it running. Thank you, Victor. If anybody else has questions, feel free to email me. Again, it's Dan, D-A-N at Mott Haven Fridge, M-O-T-T-H-A-V-E-N-F-R-I-D-G-E.com. And my phone number is 917 497 one four. I know there are other volunteers that are listening in, so hopefully they can send in their own statements of support. What's the best place for people to email a statement of support or something? Mayor, in that mayor all, all one word, mayor and board at vomny.org. Once again, that email is <laughs> mayor and board at vomny.org. Uh, is it an A-N-D or an ampersand? A-N-D. A-N-D. Oh, great, great. Yeah, Mayor and board at V-O-M-N-Y dot org. Yeah. Great. Okay. All we'll one word, know. Mayor and board. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Sposino uh, or Mark, have we heard back from the Attorney General? We have not. We have not. All right. Okay, so we'll wait on that. Uh, flood mitigation advisory review of flood plan, flood plan development permits. Just before we get onto that, at six fifteen, I'm going to move to stuff that's on for the regular meeting. Uh, so, we, have we set up a, a tickler to send uh, stuff to the flood mitigation advisory committee? How are we doing? Oh, I haven't. How do you want to do it? Whatever you want to do, we'll 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 put in place. But we haven't yet. Well, yeah, but why don't we just set up, you know, uh, in the, in, if anybody needs, you know, uh, to build anything in the flood zone. Okay. Make sure it goes to the flood mitigation advisory. What do we do? What do we do with their comments? Give them back to the boards? Yeah, give them back to the boards, just like it was a citizen's comment. Okay. We can do that. We are quite capable of doing that. I never doubted you. Jerry, Jerry the question I, I think was at one point you thought you needed a resolution from the board. If yeah. we don't have a resolution, we just can go ahead and do it. If we need a resolution, I've provided one. Yeah. Uh, so why do we need a resolution? Yes, yeah, as, as long as and, and the only the only reason I brought it up is as long as it's not something that is going to potentially impact us because those comments are going to be binding as a board. Um in litigation, which you know happens frequently uh, for us, then if it's a process that you guys want me to um, consider and follow, I can do that. If it's just a process, I'm I, th I, th I think the process is is more important. It, okay, to formalize it. The more you have potential litigation, this is just <laughs> if it comes in, it gets distributed. People look at it. Uh, they can make comments or not. That's up to them. Uh, they're not a land use board. They don't hold hearings, you know, on it. Um, you know, it's simply to get any input that would be relevant. As long as board, yeah, you know, for the whole board, as long as uh, FMAC knows that these are going to be sent to the other boards, like a resident comment or a neighbor comment, then then there's no issue. I, I don't see an issue, but maybe 
Mr. Spolzino does, but I don't see an issue with it. Bob, you want to weigh in there? I think that's fine. If there's no binding effect, there's you know there's no Article 78 from them or anything else. Right. It's citizen input. Board or ZBA, as the case may be, to weigh those comments. Okay, good. We can, we'll start that. I'll talk to uh, I'll talk to Frank T tomorrow morning and uh, Brittany tomorrow morning. All right. One uh, H uh, Board of Trustees direction for use of prior traffic study data da, 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 for Waverly Hoyt Mount Pleasant. W wasn't uh, Matt Comodi supposed to be doing stuff with the lights over there? Uh, yeah, he uh, he looked. Like at, record. You know, he he looked at. Uh, uh, the board asked if we could do a uh, all-way pedestrian phase, uh, and I had him analyze that. <clears throat> there was a question about timing it with the Hoyt Avenue signal, uh, which would also require all, uh, timing it with the Mount Pleasant Paulstead signal uh, because they are on the same traffic controller. Uh, but uh, Mr. Crumby looked at several options. Uh, first, where they what called a seven second lead pedestrian interval, a 10 second lead pedestrian interval, and a, uh, a 26 second all way stop. And one of the questions that was asked that was, uh, I, I think, uh, forwarded to comedy is in the, at two meetings ago, I think you said they were looking into whether or not the existing traffic controllers would allow or you know could be implement a four a four-way pedestrian stop if you will or however you want to put it i call it four red lights but so, you know so the question is, is is it feasible that's the first question the answer is that waverly yes it has a okay modern controller the same that the dot uses okay okay so now the question is you know should we you know should that be something should be done I, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I've read the reports. I've read all the material. There actually wasn't anything about why we should not do it. <laughs> um, well, I, I think what what uh, Matt mentioned was it would, you know, increase the yes. uh, the signal timing by uh, forty seconds or something like that. So that would have a cascading impact on other signals along the corridor. Uh, one of the things I I'm asking uh, to also look at is possibly uh, finding a better method uh, for the village to uh, time the signals along the entire corridor, corridor possibly with dynamic uh, timing. So it could be uh, different at different points of the day. Uh, and they are give, gonna give me a proposal to do uh, that analysis. The initial indication is probably yes. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, issues at play. Um, you know, what I've been, uh, and what I wanted to discuss is um, if that, that is a possibility, uh, one of the items that we've talked about with the board in the past is, you know, we have that neighborhood stabilization fund. Uh, that was set up with the Transit Oriented Development District. Uh, right now there's $175,000 in there. Uh, if this is something that we could use <clears throat> to enhance that corridor uh, to make it more pedestrian friendly, uh, is that a concept the board would like the village to pursue? I, I think anything we can do to increase the pedestrian friendliness and safety is something yes. we should be thinking about yeah. and, you know uh, but a lot of the things that have been suggested didn't make any sense um, for for additional safety reasons uh, i'm less concerned about you know as one member of the board uh a seven second delay in traffic and as opposed to trying to speed up moving the traffic I think that's part of the problem that we that we have, and that's what happens. You know, uh, the other day I was crossing and almost hit by a car because they didn't want to yield. And by the way, we need to repaint the crosswalks because they're all gone now. You know, when they tarred the road, it's all 
everything has been, you know, erased. Uh, so we need to repaint them if that's possible. Jerry, is that possible, something we can do? Mermanic Avenue? Mermanic Avenue and Waverly, yes. Yeah, so they just they just painted that. Yeah, we will. We, we can repaint them. Yeah, because uh, if you go down there, you can't see it anymore. Yeah, I think they used a, a watercolor paints because uh, they were painted it a few months ago and, and it's gone. So we'll have I, I our guys do it. I think it was more that when they put the new tar down on Mermanic Avenue, that just was tracked by you know all sorts of traffic to erase it. What happened was um, I got them to spray the crosswalks as soon as possible. I wanted it done that night. They ended up doing uh, three days later. I think it was a Monday or a Tuesday night. Okay, well, uh, whatever. But if that we can do that, it's horrible. So so I'll get them to do it again, or okay. we'll have our guys do it. Okay. okay, if that Thank would be you. possible, that would be great. Yeah, we can do it. Sure. And Thank you. I, uh, I, sorry, no, go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, part of this discussion was, could we use traffic study, traffic info we already had to get some answers? So clearly we were able to do that, which was good. We didn't have to wait for a traffic study. And I guess, you know, our schedule is we need a decision in time for the county to implement it in June, right? I mean, that's when well, well, there, there are traffic signals, so we can do what we want with them. The only okay. signal that we do not own along the Mamaroneck Avenue corridor is the signal at New Street. Um, you know, the county has uh, offered to, you know, turn that signal over to us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, my understanding is it has the latest controller as well. Uh, and we could have uh, ACARAP mm -hmm. do an inspection of the signal. Um, if we're looking to enhance greater uh, coordination among the signals, there may be an advantage to that, um, as long as the signal's in, in, in good shape. Uh, uh, I just lost my train of thought, I apologize. Uh, but uh, you know, that's an option we would like to uh, see if there's any board appetite for you know, possibly accepting that signal if, if it's in a, a proper working order as well. Uh, I do have a, uh, a report that they're working on. It's still in draft format, so I don't have it uh, complete yet. Uh, there were you know, a number of uh, low cost recommendations and some high cost recommendations. Uh, in addition to the greater coordination, I was also asking for some suggestions on uh, flood mitigation for those traffic signals, but uh, I'll, I'll get that. In, I'll get into that when I have a uh, a more uh, formal report. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, establishment of village self-insured supplemental income fund for volunteer firefighters. Uh, yeah, at the last meeting, you asked me to reach out to our insurance broker, RJ. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a conversation with him. Uh, he is collecting, or he's asked for some uh, census information on the uh, Fire department, so I'm working with the chief on uh, on getting that. Um, we also discussed uh, this theory or concept with our auditors, and uh, they presented a approach to us uh, where we could possibly use some of the uh, ARPA funds or other village funds to uh, uh, set something up. But uh, you know, we can. Uh, that's what we want to. Uh, you want us to take a look at further. We can ask for a, a more uh, formal report on that from them. I think they're going to be at. Oh, actually, they're going to be at an upcoming board meeting, uh, also a bit while when they do the uh, presentation of the audit. Yeah, March fourteenth. Yeah. I, I think that we're you know all in favor of doing it. But we just need to know the specifics. So it'd be nice if the yeah. So yeah, we're currently we've been asked to collect data by our insurance broker, and I've been coordinating with the chief on collecting that data. And the chief knows the, the reason for the collection of data, right? Absolutely. Okay. My concern, Mayor, my concern was that we probably have twice as many, if not more, volunteer firefighters than we do employees. And a regular annual fee for that insurance could be significant, as opposed to setting aside and supplementing what they would already receive from the state. That's what right. well, that was the plan, right? That it, was the plan. Cool. That was the plan, but but the insurance brokers you know, may want to sell the annual reoccurring plan. They may. Okay. You know. well, whichever, whichever. <laughs> yeah. 
And even with, uh, the, yeah. I'm sorry, Dan, go ahead. I, I, I was going to say, even with the number of volunteer firefighters, I don't know if there's a distinction between the interior and exterior certified. Right. So that's a, that's another issue that uh, may not be right. able to have that level of granularity in a proposal. And, yeah, you could also, you know, not be an interior firefighter, but, you know, really hurt your back uh, pulling hoses off a truck. That's right. Uh, thank you. And we look forward to more information. Uh, wetlands Amendment, we're going to wait for HCZMC to come on the 28th. Uh, bus shelters. Jerry, uh, I, I know you're going to reach out to the county. Is that right? Yep, we're trying to get the bulbs straightened out this week. We'll reach out to the county and see what we can't do it for President's Week next week. Okay, uh, my, my suggestion is you, you give a call uh, to Connie Green O'Donnell uh, at the town because when we did this in the town, uh, her and I were dealing with the county and she has the county uh, contact information. Of, okay. And, you know, she, she had a good report. She, she might be able to give you somebody uh, that would put you right on the scoreboard. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, 612. Let's go to the stuff that's on for the regular meeting. Oh, just as a point of information, uh, I just received information that Governor Hochul has extended the emergency order, which allows us to meet like this until March 16th, 2022. That word just in from Albany. Thank you. Thank you. Cut off the presses. You will. Uh, all right. First on for regular meeting, uh, emergency repairs to 169 Mount Pleasant. Uh, I hope you've all had an opportunity to either go to 169 Mount Pleasant, which is otherwise known as Old Village Hall, and look at some of the decay, neglect, damage uh, that that building has suffered uh, through neglect over the uh, century. Uh, when you look at, you know, when I saw pictures of the cell where uh, prisoners are kept, and, uh, you know, I'm afraid Amnesty International uh, is going to be knocking on our door. Uh, you know, and, and also with it, the, the conditions under which our police department and our judges and our building department labor under, it's, it's disgusting. So Jerry, with that prelude, I, 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 leave, I leave it to you. Um, for quite some time, a lot longer than I've been here, it seems like we have deferred maintenance on this building. Um, and I wouldn't venture a guess, but uh, there are portions of this building uh, that look like have never, that haven't been addressed and have been deteriorating for over a couple of decades. And what's happening now is it's impacting the work of, the, the, the work of our staff, the health of our staff, as well as the ability for us to continue to maintain this building uh, and potentially intercede before we have to knock it down. The extensive work that's required um, was eye-opening when I started having uh, Mr. Jeffon, who is a person of many talents, but um, has a very keen eye for construction and the experience that, that uh, um, he has gained over the years. So, so the roof, so the building has significant roof issues. It has significant building envelope issues regarding the brick. Uh, the windows are um, a mess that's easy to see from, from, the, from the street. Um, we require um, repointing throughout the, out the whole building there are issues with the stairs, the treads, uh, the blue stones, and there's also issues with doors and uh, with hardware throughout the building. That's just the exterior of the building. There's additional damage caused by the poor condition of the exterior now impacting us in the interior. So much so that I had to move a department head out of their office because the condition in that office was no longer um, safe. Uh, tomorrow, 
we will be setting up air quality monitors, 18 throughout the building, so that I can zone in on areas that can be occupied and areas that cannot be occupied. Um, as many of you know, I work at that building three to four days a week now. I want to start to get this process under, under control. And what that's going to require is a significant amount of money. Um, not much else but money, truthfully. Um, and um, I put the emergency order or the emergency declaration to, of course, gain everyone's attention, but also allow us to continue to do things as we find things um, that are safety related um, that we need to pay for without the arduous uh, bidding process. What we do have is a proposal from uh, Milcon Construction, which works with um, uh, uh, basically like a, a, a national uh, uh, vendor um, program. I think it's called, what's it called, Dan Sarnoff? As uh, US it, communities? It, it used to be called US Communities. It has some bizarre new name now, but yeah, they work, uh, they've worked with a company called Garland and they uh, did the rehab work at 234 Stanley Ave. Right, so we've worked with this company before. Um, they did uh, over a half million dollars worth of improvements and similar type work at 234 Stanley. And now it's really time for us to focus on 169 Mount Pleasant. And so what we have is a, um, with five alternates, we have a proposal of just over 1.7 million. If we're adding a 20% contingency, we are about a $2.5 million project in basic terms to try to save the building. Um, I couldn't even begin to think about relocating all of those employees in that building uh, because there are judges, there are jail cells, there are police officers, there's a police equipment, there are guns and rifles, there are um, uh, mountains and mountains of uh, file cabinets, paperwork, and if the building deteriorates more than it is, um, we would have to go buy a new building to put those people in because we couldn't build one fast enough to be able to continue to provide services for the village, especially emergency services. So the pictures are before you, the reports are before you, the mold report is before you, and the proposal is before you. And so what I need is um, for the board to be aware that we're going to move forward on this project and start to do the improvements to save the building. Unless, of course, the board decides it's best if we go buy another building, put those services in that building, and we knock down this building. And I don't think that that's something the board wants. But I could be wrong, because I'm usually wrong. That's it, Mayor. Well, there you have the choice. Either we save the building or we knock it down. Uh, it's on for the regular meeting. So the question here is, is it fine to be on for the regular meeting? Yes, me too. Yeah, I, I would say it's, and it's not a binary choice because there's quite a process for knocking down a building that's eligible for the National Register. And this building has been determined eligible. So it's not, you She's know, right. She's we right don't about that, quite no. have that flexibility. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, it's sinful that it's gotten this far. You know, it's 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 um, it, it didn't need to get this far, but that's not that's not we, today's discussion. It's been no. getting this far for a very long time, sure. and um, you know, it's it's in preservation. It's called the mushroom effect. Sometimes you'll find mushrooms in the building, yeah. but. Um, I just just want to make sure that we're not using any state or federal funds for this. Okay. We're not using any state or federal funds. Um, okay. When we want to start to improve the building, changes, make changes, um, we could go after. Right now, we need our funds or future, uh, uh, you know, future bonding uh, to mm -hmm. start to improve um, and make the make the improvements. Um, I, I was remiss also, and thank you, Nora, for clarifying that it's not an easy process to knock down a building. Um, 
we have a team now. Um, Frank Tavalox is our building inspector. He's a former builder. And, and Jeff Hahn, we're very dedicated to trying to, to um, um, make these improvements, uh, especially since it benefits our, our employees. Of course, the extension is if it benefits our employees, it benefits the community. But we have a strong team now that we can um, work on these projects in-house and continue to watch over them. Just like I, I and, and Mark Ferraro and Mike uh, Iannarelli um, and James, of course, watch over the sewer project. Um, we have in-house staff that's willing to take on extra responsibilities to make sure that um, we can get this building cleaned up and livable or workable in the future. Okay. I follow up right. with two questions mm -hmm. related to what you just said. One is just to pick up the, the issue of funding. Uh, this is something we could bond, I, I assume. That's where we're heading. And probably in the meantime, as, as we move forward, we, we'll use uh, some fund balance to cover. Is that the plan? That would be. Uh, uh, the, the fund balance use, Victor, would be uh, of the board's decision. Yeah. But, but now, we, you, you're going to move forward with this. Essentially, essentially yeah. you're more or less uh, uh, authorizing or expecting to, to use at least the 300 uh, from from our fan balance you know, in, a, in a very short time, right? Very short time. Start, start how, how, about, how about the timing of the other piece, the million seven? So what I'll do is um, um, I'll get back to you on the timeline for the balance of the work, um, but we need to start sealing up the building and that's the first priority. So for the base work? Mm-hmm, yep, okay. for the base work. So then All right. this, and then the second question I also relate to what you were just talking about is uh, you need, do you need a, um, permits, state, local, uh, county permits? Do you need any permits for this? For our building. And it's not on the register, it is eligible. Um, and so everything would have the, the eye to make sure that we're not, you know, <sighs> destroying any chance of putting it on the register in the future. But as far as permits, we don't need anything from the county. What we do need is, um, and we may, we may get into a little bit of a bind with this, if we make any interior alterations, which we don't really expect to do, um, the um, uh, public safety agency, I can't recall what it is, that oversees the police department um, would, be, um, would be advised. We could, and I don't know if we have to, but we could, if we make any interior changes, have to contact the Office of Port Administration, but I don't think so. Uh, because we're not really going to do any alterations. We are going to replace doors. We are going to fix walls, um, but it's all gonna be in-kind stuff. Okay, so if I may then to follow up as we're all here now, but this may drag, I don't know for how long, maybe inclusive whereas that whereas this work may require, you know, the, the um, getting, uh, letters of approval, permits, et cetera, and that uh, the village will, will pursue that and obtain those permits yeah, we will. Before, before doing, before undertaking any work. Just so that the Board of Trustees is essentially not just ordering you to do this regardless of permits, but so that there's no, uh, no interpretation of that nature. I, I certainly I hope nobody would go that way, but it's better to be safe. And then something on the resolve, the same line that you would, you would Get the, oh, the hold on, hold on, hold on. This is this is emergency work. Yes. Right. So I I, I guess Even emergency work worried. sometimes needs permits. Uh, yeah, I know. Just let me finish what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, right now we don't know that there's any permits that are needed. Do you want them to begin searching out whether there's permits needed before they start the work? No, they know they know what they need to do. I'm just covering uh, the I, basic I thing. The board of trustees is saying. That if anything is required, that they will, that they will obtain it before undertaking any work. The, 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 the resolution has the, the catch-all, which I put in most resolutions, that the managers are authorized to take the administrative acts necessary to effectuate the work. That's so, on the proactive. I, I was I was looking something specific on on 
on essentially that we're not authorizing this regardless of anything that is never that is that comes up as necessary. Let's say you get a you, you do find that you probably need to check with somebody. I'm sure you'll do it, but I just want to end the resolution. Yeah, That's fine. it's appropriate. That's it's it's appropriate. I'm not concerned about it. Do do repointing the brick, uh, replacing the windows with in kind, um, uh, doing the the roof. Um, that's our target, uh, but but that's appropriate. What what tr Trustee Tafor is saying is appropriate. I don't have a problem making sure we have everything we need from every agency that we may be um, uh, that we may require some kind of communication with. That's fine. It's easier to do it ahead of time. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm okay with that because I know the scope. Jeff and I and, and Frank know the scope of this work. Um, and I, you know, like the back of our hand. I know Jeff has been his, I mean, he's really got a sense of how to take care of an old building, which is, which we're very lucky about. I mean, that's yeah. it. And, um, you know, to the extent that any changes are made, it's just good to document them really with photographs, yep. you know, Okay. and, um, you know, the only, you know, the thing about buildings like this is that the more sometimes mortar is used now and the mortar is too strong and it causes oh. other problems with the brick so making sure whoever is doing the pointing knows how to repoint historic buildings is really important because you don't want you, the mortar is supposed to give away and sometimes they point it with a, a concrete that basically destroys the fabric so we spend okay. a lot of money and then have to replace bricks we don't want to do that Yep. Right. And we'll use our drone to document the condition of the entire building all it. the way around and all through it. The work Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I took a tour of the, of the building uh, three weeks ago at the invitation of the two justices when I was first appointed. And you'll notice uh, item N is a result of that visit. The, um, the requested that we establish a, a, a trustee liaison because it was obvious to me that they felt isolated, cut off, and not communicated with and disrespected. And I could see they were working in a dump. And uh, somehow uh, we haven't been paying attention. So uh, that I would like that to be considered also. I mean, I, I, how this got this far, and it's a surprise at this point is stunning. Okay. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get to that on the agenda when we get to and it. To and to Lou's point, we should make sure that the judges are looped in too. To what what? Goes on. I mean, to lose point, we should make sure that the, that all the staff that works there is looped in because they're going to know better than anybody else. All right, we, we, we got a lot of stuff to cover. So, so to finish my point, between now and the and the regular session, can Dan draft something? Jerry's comfortable saying we'll pursue those. Per if anything comes up, you'll 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 you know find those, get those permits, get those letters before proceeding yep. with any work. And, yeah, it was a, you know, uh, in whereas, the grass and in the result somewhere. You've done this many times. So. Yeah, I'll just say it's like whereas uh uh right. done. 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 Yeah. We, we need to move on. Just yeah. get it done. Yeah, and, and just uh, just one, one point that's important. Lou, Lou, we all toured that building. I did it six years ago. It was appalling there. We've attend made so many attempts to to go to the new the building and exploring it. Unfortunately. Doesn't you know that the slow government is, is something that is so pervasive? Let me tell you, you can't realize. But probably what we're doing today is the right thing. Just moving. I, on I know. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, you know what nose blind is. Oh, yeah, Victor, that's that's what I think happened. I'm new and I can smell it. All right, we got to move on. It's awful. Uh, <clears throat> declaration of 2005 Chevy Suburban a surplus on for regular meeting. So selling an old car. Everybody okay with this? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, public safety infrastructure grant on for regular meeting. Uh, this is getting money for public safety. Correct. What yeah. Forty-seven thousand uh, dollars. The police and this is one hundred percent reimbursable. The police department wants to spend, I think, about thirty-five, thirty-six thousand on a uh, a key fob access, a controlled access system for the police department. Mm -hmm. uh, engineering and design services for Halstead Avenue on for regular meeting. Uh, Jerry, uh, this is something that's also you, been- You forgot D, I think, Tom. Okay, Grant with New York State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, the open space study on for regular meeting. Uh, this is a grant that we got from uh, the state to conduct a uh, open space acquisition study to 
maintain and enhance buffers between the Sheldrake River and uh, the industrial area. Okay. Uh, everybody's all right with that? That's for Grant. Uh, engineering design for Halstead Avenue on for regular meeting. This is another item that's been kicking around for 100 years. Uh, Halstead Avenue is now a village uh, street, it used to be a county street. Uh, it used to have a trolley on it. When they took away the trolley, they didn't pull up the uh, trolley bed or the trolley tracks. They just uh, asphalted over it. And so subsequently, uh, it, it, it has always uh, been a problem and a street of disrepair. Jerry, if I'm not wrong, this would comprehensively fix the street, or this is study to comprehensively see what we have to do to fix the street. It is. The, the objective is to have full width re, uh, a reconstruction of the um, paving of that street, including all the improvements that are required by law, such as the uh, ADA handicap ramps and any kind of curbing that potentially could be uh, replaced at this time to make the improvement, um, but full width, full depth, all the way down to the, uh, to the base course. Um, and so that's the objective. Where to where? Posted Avenue. Uh, the the whole entire thing. From Maranek Avenue to the Harrison Line, Lou. Got it. It's uh, just uh, under one mile. I'd like to point out that Jerry has been very successful at getting uh, by competitive bidding, getting uh, about the hundred and yeah forty thousand dollar reduction in hungry the costs. Yeah. Some people are hungry to do the work, so that's good. I'm glad. Yeah. Some people have a lot of work, so well, it, really it, 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 it it proves the point that competitive bidding, uh, you know, or proposals is is exceedingly helpful these days. I agree. So we're comfortable with Keller's sessions. We know their um, operation. We know their principles. So we would ask at the regular meeting to approve the Keller's sessions 96 450. Uh, Keller's session has been uh, a very good uh, salt for the village. Mm -hmm. We appreciate their work and uh, some of the uh, strains we work that they well are together. on. Uh, purchase of sanitation vehicle on for regular meeting. <coughs> Uh, this is a scheduled replacement of a sanitation vehicle. Uh, the quote expires uh, basically in two weeks, so we'd like to uh, move this forward. It's uh, off the uh, source well contract. It's you know, basically the same specs as, as usual, 25-yard rear packer, low entry. Um, so we're looking to move forward with this. Was this in the capital budget plan? Yeah, yeah. this was yeah. one of the it's items it. in the capital budget plan. I think it's replacing okay. a 21-year-old garbage truck, which is the, the challenge for us is that we won't see it until um, uh, probably November, December um, yeah. of next year, yeah. not this year. Yeah, 437 day lead time right now. Yeah, yeah. So we're 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 behind uh, on on trucks, but but we have a great staff at the mechanics. We are fully staffed at the mechanics shop now, so we'll keep uh, we'll keep our old trucks limping along as best we can. Okay, thank you. And thank you to our mechanics for doing a difficult job. Issuance of RFP for design services for window replacement of a building on a national register uh, of a store place. This is the Stanley Avenue uh, Community Counseling Center. Yep. Uh, you know, we've been working to get quotes for window replacement. It's going to exceed $35,000, which means it needs to go out to public bid, uh, which means we need, you know, uh, uh, engineering architectural drawings. Uh, we're requesting authorization to issue an RFP, uh, invite firms that have a specialty uh, in historic restoration. Um, there is a list that uh, Trustee Lucas provided to me a couple of years ago of uh, uh, firms that have been successful recipients of, uh, I think, Preservation League uh, grants. And, and I have experience with three of them. But I, I'm fairly confident that any firm on this list who has experience with historic restoration would be capable of, of preparing uh, the plans that we would be looking for. Can I ask, what, what, what is the estimated cost difference between historic windows and regular windows? Uh, I, we didn't look at that because it is on the National Register. We want to do uh, I, I know what it is. Oh, okay. 
I, is, I know what it is. So, so we're at eighty thousand. We're at eighty thousand for reproduction windows and uh, one sixty for the um, historic, whatever the terminology is, replacement windows. It was double, double the price. In kind, but they're in kind. In kind. Yeah, almost double. But the, they're also but in they're the all, double the, the price one, neighborhood. But the, um, I think the in-kind windows are thermal. I'm not sure that the first replacement was thermal. I, I don't, I think the in-kind windows- That may be the case. You might be right. And I, I, I think, I'm because, sorry, because, they're, it's because they're metal windows, I think you'll find with the um, 169 building, because they're wooden windows, with the exception of the arched windows, they're gonna be much easier to find. It's hard to find vendors who do metal windows. Okay, my, 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 my question is how, how, are we, how are we benefiting by having these on the historic register? I mean, if we had to spend 90 grand more for the roof, we're spending 80 grand more for the windows. So we're out 170 grand. I'm not sure we spent 90 grand more for the roof, Tom. I think- I'm pretty we just sure we did. I, I'm not sure because I think actually the way they did it with using the architect they used, he was able to save some money because he was able to figure out a less expensive repair than what the previous vendor had wanted to do. Um, and I think basically, you know, our consultant, we have the, our grant consultant, um, has, we haven't been applying for historic preservation grants. And I think that's something that we should ask them more about. I mean, I think that's a good, that's a, that would be a good thing to pursue. Yeah, I, I guess, but it, it, it just, I just see money going out and not any coming in. We have these buildings that are ancient and are turning to sand, and it, it, it's harder and harder to. Well, and I will say they're ancient. Harder, and turning, they're, okay. they're turning to sand because we have not taken care of the buildings. I, mean, I understand, it's, but now it's getting it's more expensive to take care of it. Right, but it's it's never more expensive to repair it as you go, and that's what you know. But we didn't do maybe, that. But... And maybe we aren't a candidate for you know having a lot of real estate, but we're a village that has a lot of um, has a lot. You know, we we don't have centralized buildings. Now, did, did we ask to have it designated as a historic place? We, yeah. we did this to ourselves. We did this to ourselves. Yes. Okay. All right, we gotta move on. Three up to go and we gotta get going. Which one are you up to? Uh, hotel occupancy. Okay, sorry. Thanks. Okay, Th this is renewal of hotel occupancy tax. Uh, the village gets a three percent tax on every hotel room that gets rented out for the night. We have, I believe, the Mamaric Hotel and uh, Vincent's Motel. And uh, I mean, we get you know some, a few thousand dollars a year. Oh, you didn't know off the top of your head around 20, what? Twenty k. Twenty thousand dollars a year uh, for enacting this tax, and uh, I guess it's paid on an hourly basis. <laughs> some of the places. Uh, so this is on for the regular meeting. Uh, any questions or concerns? I don't have a problem with it. Actually, I think it's good. But why are we not? Why are we not collecting the same tax from A or um, Airbnb, et cetera? It's a good question. If, if you could keep track of Airbnbs. But I, I don't know if the law allows you to, because I think you have to have a motel license like that, or, or a hotel license. But it, it obviously is a good uh, uh, question for our uh, leaders in Albany. Well, can we ask yes, uh, Matt to, uh, and Bob to look into that and find out? We can. I don't think the law is caught up with Airbnbs, Dan, but um, we can look at it. Sure. Okay. I, I've heard both arguments from different people both ways that it is covered and isn't covered. I don't know. I haven't done the research, but uh, I think that's something that would be helpful. Yep. No problem. Okay. Uh, then you got a chase of it. Okay. Uh, relocation of mural from high school on for regular meeting. Nora, myself, Lou attended a meeting. Uh, with members of the his historical society, members of uh, Lodgemont uh, Village Board, members of uh, Town of Marinick Board, and the high school is uh, doing a STEM building, and uh, which is you know a, a good project. But they have these six murals or eight murals rather, and uh, 
the historical society uh, wants to preserve them. They uh, they follow the uh, literature of uh, James Fenimore Cooper, a uh, prominent uh, village of Mamaroneck resident for some time, uh, who many say is the uh, the founder of the first American real American novel. Um, and you know, it, it, so they they have to move these murals and try to find uh, suitable homes for them. Uh, the town of Mamaroneck has uh, gracefully offered to take most of them. Uh, we talked about taking one and trying to put one in our courtroom. Uh, and Nora made a good point that they should probably be grouped together because they were uh, kind of done in a, in a, in a fashion where you, you could get the whole tableau of uh, Mr. Cooper's work. Uh, Cost a lot of money. It, 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 this isn't going to be a burden on the taxpayers. Uh, the historical society has has to rate it a minimum of one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and they had about a month to do it. Yeah. So I don't know uh, if they made any significant progress. Uh, so this might be a pig and a poke, uh, and it might not come to fruition. But I, I think we should uh, at least offer to take one in uh, if if the need arises. And Back. And, and Nora made the point that it was very, very well, it was perfect because altogether these uh, paintings make sense. Individually, they're underwhelming. Uh, some of them are underwhelming and they may not, uh, they may actually not have a great, uh, a great, elicit a great reaction. So um, if we do take one, we should do, well, I'm hoping we could have representations of the other other uh, paintings and, and an explanation about what this means to Mamaroneck, uh, because uh, that's it, it would only be of value to us. Museums don't want it. It's not great art. Um, uh, it's only of value to Mamaroneck because it's our history, and it's our history because it's Cooper, and it's about the stories when you know Indians used to live here, uh, some of them, and it's about the school in 1941. And, and, and the way the paintings were, were, uh, were displayed and the generations of, of Americanic residents who viewed them. So there's, it ties a lot of things together and that's, the, that's why they're worth saving, I think, but that, uh, that's my two cents. Yeah, I mean, I think a mu most museums just don't have the real estate. It's four, it's eight large murals. It's a group of three and a group of five. And you know, ideally they would be kept together, but if they can't be kept together, they will be documented so that if you're looking at yeah. one, you'll get the you'll get the information about the others, and you'll get you know you'll get the local history. And I think they have huge local significance, but um, we have you know it's it's not it's not something most museums can install, and it's not something that lends itself to a traveling exhibition because they need to be mounted in a fairly permanent way. Okay, so what, what we're asking for here is to put this on the agenda to pass a resolution saying that we would, uh, if necessary, and if, uh, you know, obviously this isn't a cost to the taxpayer, we would make a home for one uh, in the courthouse. So that's on for regular agenda. Is the board okay with that? Sure, okay. we, sh we should probably discuss it with the justices also. <laughs> it, it's awkward. Uh, all right, scheduling a fiscal year 2023 budget work session on for regular meeting. Uh, let's just look, look at these right now. Uh, Jay. Okay. Does everybody see? Uh, Nora, I know you sent an email today. Could you just remind me of it? March 31st. Yes, it's, it should be, it's either Tuesday, is it Tuesday or Wednesday? No. March 31st? I didn't write it, but I know you were right. March 31st is a, a Thursday. Yeah. Thursday. Right, but we had written, I think the memo says Wednesday. Now I can't yeah, so it should be a Thursday. Hmm? So we're going to do it Thursday? I mean, I guess the question is, are we doing it, is the date right or is the day correct? March 31st is a, is a Thursday. Right, but the question is, do they mean March I, 31st? I understand. Or do they it mean March be, 31st? Should it be, you're just saying it should it be March 30th? 
I followed Wednesday. the resolution from 2019. I was asked to follow that resolution and it was a Wednesday. So it should be okay. March 30. Okay. Is that fine with everybody? Yes, actually that, that okay. works for me. I... The zoning board is uh, zoning board is the 31st on Thursday. So that doesn't work for us. So we, we may be forced to start to meet in person again. All right. Yeah. Victor, you were saying something? I was saying a couple of things. First, well, probably on that note, I think this in, these meetings are really important. I think regardless of, of the of the requirement of, of the meetings, meetings law, open meetings law, et cetera, I think that we should we should uh, tape them and, and make them available in Zoom since we have the technology. That's number one. But my real substantive comment is, you know, I've been at this for a few years, five now, six. And if I recall two years where we, we had probably uh, not a smoother, but but a clear vision was when we had a meeting, I think probably Jerry was one and probably one with the, one of the prior village managers, where we, where we have an earlier meeting and we more or less discuss what's, what are the big goals. And with that meeting then, then the, the manager and his, his department heads get, get together and, and draft that early budget which under this schedule is March 18. But we will not, we will essentially with this format, we will just see it without any, any of our prior input. And that was probably last year because it was, we were under the gun last year for several reasons. But the year before that, we probably did this early, the first meeting that, that and I, I recall ha having that meeting before. So my suggestion number one is to have an earlier discussion or a preliminary discussion, um, probably in two weeks, if, so that you have time to to include those comments. Otherwise, it becomes more of why did you do this? Why did you do that? And if not, it's, it's, it's more of in line, and you will have all the answers. But we will not have any. So I do think it's 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 really important to have one meeting before yeah. that on the overall broad goals. That's number one. And my second observation is, again, learning from experience is that we only have one meeting at the no end way. and it says if necessary for income. I think what I've learned is that learning income and those, it's, it's, it's probably the most important. It says, it says here, it says April 12th, Tuesday, review budget, including revenue and expenses if necessary. The, the revenues, is always a very, very important meeting, even if it's if they're small compared to the tax that we get, but it is central. So my two recommendations are have one meeting before the, the March 18 introduction, and two, also um, bring up the issue of, of revenues. And I think that one we did we did incorporate last year. Last year we had to incorporate a meeting. So those two, those are my two, my two requests. Other than than keeping you no know, taping this with that that it's now we have the technology. To do. I, I I think what we found in in years before was trying to discuss revenues before we had uh, a full view of what was coming in and what was going out was trying to shoot uh, you know a, a moving target. And if if I remember correctly, you know that was some of the difficulty was the board, some board of trustee members uh, anticipated uh, great shortfalls in revenue, which then weren't uh, forthcoming. And uh, you know, it, it, it ended up uh, when the numbers came out that we had actually uh, gotten in more revenue than we had anticipated. So I, I think the problem with revenue is you don't have the numbers early enough. You don't have a complete picture. You know, you, we could talk about ways and strategies to raise revenue. We could talk about other ways to, to, to uh, have non-taxable revenue increases. And I think that that is uh, a good conversation to have. But I, I think from my memory and my experiences is that the, the numbers aren't always available. And uh, while it's of course very important, you know, it, they, it's just uh, shooting in the dark. And it, it's almost a waste of a meeting to do it too early. But I think 
to have a meeting earlier to talk about budget priorities, I think that that is a useful exercise. I think that the budget should be, you know, a, a, an aspirational goals of where we want to take this community. And I, I think that, and I talked about that uh, last year at the end of the budget process, that we should be doing that, you know, looking at, you know, where, where we want to go and what we want to do. And so I think I, I agree with that part, but I, I well, think that we should, you know, ask for recommendations on how to increase revenue, but, you know, give them an opportunity to get all the, the uh, numbers in before we uh, make revenue projections that then become moot as uh, information becomes more available. And I, I would suggest that, that perhaps uh, starting on the 28th, not the 20, yeah, the 28th we have a meeting, uh, try and start on the 28th earlier and do a budget conversation then, like maybe take an hour uh, before and do an hour on budget philosophy, budget goals, budget uh, you know, where we want to go as a community so that we don't have to schedule another meeting, which always becomes very difficult. And uh, you know, I'll just leave work early that day. So would you guys be amenable to having a, a meeting on February 28th earlier? Um, if I may. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd like to suggest we do the 23rd. The 28th is a regular meeting, you know, yeah. longer and longer. Let me finish, please. Um, I'm I would suggest that we do the 23rd. What I, I think Victor's uh, comment about uh, doing income is, in is important. I think your comment about goals is exceedingly important. But the one thing that doesn't appear on the schedule, unless I'm missing it, is the capital budget, which also has, should be part of where we are on all of this. Um, and, you know, we're starting a little late. Uh, there are reasons for it. But I think, you know, we need to, you know, we I know everybody takes this very seriously. Um, you know, staff takes this very seriously. But, you know, just rushing through it doesn't give us time to reflect on where we are. So, uh, I agree with you. I think we need at least one more meeting. I'd like to suggest the 23rd devoted solely to the budget. I agree we need one more meeting, but I can't do February 23rd. I'm sorry. Can we do earlier on the 28th? Four o'clock? Victor always says he has, he's teaching that day. I don't know if you can. No, 28th is a Monday. Yeah, can you do? I could, I could do, uh, yeah, I could start at four. Okay. Okay, start at thank four. you. Yes, and, but we do it, I, 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 I second uh, Justine Hatches, uh, we need, we need to talk about the budget, uh, a capital budget also early on. There's so much work and the staff, you, you've been tremendous. So it, it, it should be now a simpler, kind of, uh, looking at the, looking at the graph actually kind of moving one year ahead yep. so it could be we could fold it into one of the meetings and also i do take my point very strongly mayor that we need to do two things uh because revenue and expenses you gave me a counter argument which is that things were not very clear i think that only applied for last year unless i hear from Again, I don't think I'm going to hear from him that he has now any issues having figuring out where his revenues are going to come from or, 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 or Jerry, I'm sorry, I didn't want to put Augie there because really Jerry is, is the budget officer. But I think so, it was last year where we were struggling, but now you, know, you, you will be able to, to, to work with the numbers early on. It was specific year. So I do, I, I do strongly urge that revenues be, be brought up earlier. I, I all right, what, 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 very important. Just to, to, to your point, why don't we move revenue to March 30th, if, if they can have it, and do the Harbor Master on April 12th to switch those days? Yeah, Mayor, is it possible we can do capital on March 7th? March 7th? March 7th. Capital. Yeah. Because yeah. We don't need we don't need capital involved in our regular general budget because we have a so, so the difference the difference in this process is that I and my department heads, especially Dan and Augie, but other um, key department heads, oh, are sure. thinking about 
increasing revenue and new areas and talking about expenses all year long. So it's this is not the dates are just for the discussion regarding the the, the, the public uh, uh, viewing and the the board to talk to us. But we have a great we have a great handle on our budget. We have a great handle on our capital budget. You do you do. L we, listen, we can talk I, whenever I, I you want. To, hold on, I hate to interrupt everybody. We had something we were going to do at six fifty. So let's let let's batten this down. Okay. Uh, February twenty eighth. We're adding February twenty eighth at 4 p.m. budget discussion before regular meeting. Yep. Big picture, right? Big picture. Big picture. Okay, I got it. Okay, how about, uh, like I suggested, uh, moving the expenses up to the 30th of March and moving Harbor Master to April 12th. Does that satisfy everybody? Okay. Yes, yeah. with, I'm good with, with that. With, with that, the 12th, it's Harbor Master and other necessaries, you know, the, the okay. usual okay. final look at it. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. With those changes. No, and then I'm oh, sorry. And then Jerry added March 7th for capital budget. March 7th, I can't. Okay. I, 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 I don't know other days. Okay. If you can't, then, then don't worry about it. We'll pick that another for another check schedules day. Let's try yeah. and uh, do that. Okay. All right. Okay. So with exclusion, excluding March 7th with the, with the changes I delineated, which are February 28th, 4 p.m. We're going to do big picture before the regular meeting. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, March 30th is going to be budget review, including revenue expenses. Uh, and then April 12th is going to be Harbor Master, uh, Parks and Recreation, and other items if necessary. Mm -hmm. I make the motion that we approve the schedule. One second. Can, can we add to the March thirtieth, uh, the, the 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 capital budget review? Is, isn't is it doable? It's it's, doable? Jerry was saying he doesn't want to do them in in the capital budget in the regular. Well, on the thirtieth. I know. Uh, because it's part uh, of our so it's part of our schedule. I I can do capital whenever you want. If you want to add it, add it to but the to the I end of a regular meeting. I can do that. I have no problem. I can do capital anytime. All right. Fine, fine. Don't worry about it. But the, and the All other right, agreement ready. I put is that we that we that we we tape tape our discussions. I think they're very important. Yeah, that's fine too. All right, sure, of course. Okay. Yeah. So we include that 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 the board will will record this in Zoom and make it available to the residents. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, with, with all those caveats, I'd make that motion. Somebody second, please. Second. Board call roll. Trustee Young. Yes. Trustee Natchez. Yes. Trustee Lucas. Yes. Trustee Tafor. Yes. Mayor Murphy. Hi. Uh, okay, now we have an executive session. Uh, I'm going to make a motion that we go to executive session for the following items. Item A, uh, discussion of the village manager complaint against the Board of Trustees uh, pursuant to 105-1D of the New York State Public Office Law. Uh, B, uh, Garden Road is anticipated that a motion will be offered to go into executive session pursuant to 105 1H of the New York State Public Offices Law. Uh, item C, litigation update. It is anticipated that a motion will be offered to enter into executive session pursuant to 105 1D of the New York State Public Offices Law to discuss McCrory versus Village of Mamaric, Stuart Teekert versus Village of Mamaric, Cindy Goldstein versus Village of Mamaric et al. Uh, and item D, uh, retention of search firm for full-time village employee is anticipated that a motion will be offered to enter into executive session pursuant to 1051F of the New York State Public Offices Law, la la la. Uh, and I make all those motions. I need a second to the motion. Second. I know you've got to, I'll I I... Yeah. What, Victor? A, uh, we, there was another item because there, we, we received a communication that we're going to consider. So I think that's not 105. Somebody help me. I think it's another. I think so, you want F. I think you mean what? F. We have to add F. It has to be more than just litigation. Yeah. It's the broad. I don't I don't have it in top of my head. 106. It's, it's, 10, it's 105. 1F. Oh, one of, uh, like, like D. In addition to D, which we have, we add F. Okay, with that amendment, I make the motion. I need a second. 
Second. All you call. Trustees Young? Yes. Trustees Natchez? Yes. Trustee Lucas? Yes. Trustee Tafor? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. All those that should be on the first call, please go to the executive session. Sally, call call me so we can finalize the meeting uh, memo. I got it, Jerry. Thanks. I'll do. Thanks.
Sally, did you see the uh, updated resolution for 169 Mount Pleasant? No, Dan, did you send it to me? I did. Do you... you need for it to be posted? What? Yeah, it needs to be posted. You okay, have... I'll take care of it. Okay, Let me take a look, you're welcome. Dan, I do have an email from you saying what you did, but it doesn't have the resolution attached. Oh, so the Stanley Avenue thing? Who was, uh, uh, where? where? What does that building look like? Is it a beautiful? I'm an, okay, okay, good. I like to be here, doggy. <laughs> I don't know if you, I don't know if you noticed that. I got. It. I was talking to somebody. One of those. Uh... Okay, we, we're waiting for more people. Okay, we we just have uh, two board members on. For those of you who are attendees, uh, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. We ran a little late. All right, for any inconvenience. Nora and Victor. Meeting catering. I'll switch to uh, Baby Dukes, I think. And, uh, too easy. Yeah, yeah. This is pretty cheap. Can you 
you try one night. Most of our decisions are based on people letters. Ah. A lot of places just won't deliver to us. And who will bill us? Yeah, and who will bill us? A lot of places won't even bill us. Can't do this. It's, well, it's very good. It is. I had to. I told my son's a couple times. Good. Yeah, I said, I said, I said, I said, she said, what do you want? I said, I'll have one of his tops have. That's good. <laughs> Jerry, you want something good? Just ask for Jerry to get. Okay. Right. Jerry gets the goods. Yeah, Jerry. <laughs> He's a foodie. Yeah. Okay. So we were raised by wolves, but we found out that we have to take care of ourselves in order to, uh, you know, survive. So we became well, foodie Bobby and I. But we so were raised by. Whenever um, he's interested in teeth, no good. Just pay attention to what Jerry's ordering. Yeah, they copy my orders. So. All right. Uh, so, you know, we, we we need. We're missing a couple of trustees here. Not a quorum. I'll give them to ten after. It's it's eight oh eight. I said eight oh five. Tom, I know you probably know this, but. Uh, just to remind you to close one session. Thank you. Work session. They had a um, back in the days when you used to have to dial up with a computer and uh, index something. Somebody who uh, went to the Tokyo Olympics and they uh, dialed up the computer and just you know left for the day and was just on all day. Long distance back in the day, Tokyo to New York. <laughs> Fifteen thousand dollar phone bill. Yeah, I remember I was talking to my kids about they, they don't get the concept of long distance calling. Oh no, no. My brother, when we were younger, had a girlfriend who went to California, Colorado for the summer. Yeah. And uh, we got a phone bill. This is I don't know in the seventies, ninety dollars. Oh God, yeah. And my father flipped, and he put one of those locks on the phone. The mm -hmm. locks that you couldn't. You had to go Same to him. thing with me. You had to go to him for the key. Unlock the phone. He watched you dial. That was a local number. And, yeah, it, and it was a, a, a back in, in college. You had a pay phone in the in the hallway. Yeah. And you're calling some girl and you're begging people for change. Yeah, right. <laughs> Before she hangs up on you. <laughs> Um, I, I, you know what? I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, uh let, let, let it call Nora. Let's see if uh, got three to rumble. I know, but uh, yeah, that's for him. Little quorum, uh, he's calling Nora. I don't see them in attendees. No, I don't know what happened here. All right, we, we got to start the meet. I'll go send her. I'll send her a message. Tell them we're starting. We, we have a quorum. We're starting. Yeah, please do. Uh, I'll talk slowly. Uh, I'll do it. I'll send one to Victor also. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll wait until you send a text before I start. Okay. Mayor, I'm, I have Nora on the line. Her computer just crashed, so she's working on getting back on. Okay, when she gets back on. Okay, all right, I'll let you go. You know, we got to start the meeting. I don't know about Victor. All right, uh, we are still at, technically in the work session. Uh, we have come out of executive session. There was a vote taken in executive session, and the vote was to hire an attorney, uh, Sokoloff Stern, uh, to represent Trustee Natchez 
in potential litigation arising out of an EEOC complaint, and that passed four to zero. Uh, I need a motion to close the work session. So moved. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Trustee Natchez raised his hand, indicating aye. Yeah, uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, oh, there and welcome to the Village of America Board of Trustees meeting for February 14th, uh, 2022. Uh, happy Valentine's Day uh, to all of you who are home with your loved ones, and I, and I hope if you're home with your loved ones, you're actually not watching this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I need a motion to open up this meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor of opening the meeting? Aye. 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 Okay. We have three eyes. Uh, adoption of the agenda. So moved. Am I going to second? I can't hear it. You got to, you got to, you got to articulate the recording. We're having trouble with the computer here. So it keeps going on and off and, and stopping. So the answer is yes. Okay, you're second. Uh, or we call the roll. Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. The four? Mayor Murphy? Hi, Vic, I don't know what's going on. I see your mouth move, but we can't hear you, just so you know. Uh, okay, first item on the agenda is communication to the board. Three up. Uh, let's go with Doreen first. Hello, Ms. Roney. Good evening, Mayor and Board. Um, I have three things that I wanted to point out. One is uh, the USGS river gauges. Um, I know you received a memo, not you, but the board of trustees received a memo from Harbor Coastal Zone after we unanimously voted in 2017 to fund to get the stream gauges back up and running. I'm pleased to see that the backup uh, that Trustee Natchez provided mm -hmm. and took the initiative on and he contacted uh, and received correspondence back from Gary Wall. Um, there was a provided update of where Harbor Coastal Zone left off. What Gary Wall and his posted on your agenda stated uh, in his email was that the final cost is contingent on site reconnaissance which they'd initiate as soon as they hear if there's a decent likelihood of this going forward. Is there anyone on this board that believes the village is not in need of an early network system that warns the public and first responders mm. about impending flooding? Is there any reason not to ask USGS to do reconnaissance, uh, reconnaissance for these three sites? Uh, you don't have to answer that, but you know this has been hanging in the wings since 2017, and uh, you know being proactive rather than reactive is always a good goal. The se second thing I'd like to bring up is an issue of foil requests. Um, back in October, when there was a public hearing on the new tree law, I did a foil request on October 1st but I received information back from the FOIL records officer that due to staff workload and the number of FOIL requests, I wouldn't get a response to my FOIL on or before 
January 25th, 2022. I specifically requested the backup records necessary for consistency and seeker determinations on that law. I wish to participate, however, not having these records, I, it stopped me. So four months later on January 25th, I received a certified response from the deputy village clerk that after a diligent search, there are no records supporting that your board considered consistency and seeker when you adopted the tree law. If that's not bad enough, while I was checking to see if there was any response, I noticed that the Journal News did a FOIL request on December 29th and received a response on the 21st of January. That was less than 20 days. I'd really appreciate if maybe the board can inquire and provide me with an answer on why one FOIL request, which was submitted two or three months later than mine was answered in 17 work days while mine submitted in October had not yet been responded to. Is that possible? No answer. There's something funny going on with FOIL. I just would like to know how that happens. Last um, I spoke at your meeting, we talked. I talked about the LWRP and how the Board of Trustees is the lead agency for our village's LWRP's implementation. Um, there are two things I'd like to point out that are really, really important. Um, as lead agency of our LWRP, uh, that board of trustees at the time and yours gives assurance to both New York state and federal government that you'll enforce consist consistency provisions in our local state and federal laws. And the board of trustees needs to provide a consistency local law that's consistent with our LWRP. To be clear, this covers a review procedure that fulfills two very basic management structure requirements which are found on page 99 of our uh, LWRP. One is establishing a review procedure whereby local permitting authorities, primarily the Board of Trustees, the Board of Appeals, the Planning Board, and the Building Inspector takes into consideration and makes determinations regarding the consistency of proposed actions with the policies of the LWRP. Before these determinations being made by the permitting authorities, proposed actions in the coastal zone will be referred to the Coastal Zone Management Com Commission for its review and comment. And this comment will be considered by the permitting authorities when making determinations of consistency. The second law is the local seeker law, which requires that local actions have to be consistent to the maximum extent practical with policies of this program. In this way, the coastal management policies contained herein will receive maximum consideration prior to the granting of permits. Given this management structure cited and these requirements in state and federal consistency law, consistency determinations are required prior to considering an action under seeker. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the village current consistency law is way out of compliance with state and federal law by requiring seeker determinations prior to consistency. Okay, Ms. Ms. Rory, thank you uh, for your comments. Uh, I, uh, I'm not finished, and don't I have you know, five your time? Your time is well up. Thank you very much for your comments. Really, I have three minutes uh, Ms. and 50 seconds. Ms. Van Eyf goes next. Mayor. Hmm. You know, she's a former. You know, uh, she's and trying to fine, communicate Richard, certain but, things. I, I think no, you give her, no, no, give her, I'm sorry, give her. Richard, there, there are rules for a reason. She's way over five minutes, and you, you, you've taken she, me down this. She's been trying path. to cover many topics. We appreciate her. Her information is always useful. She, even she, if you have topics to five minutes. Everybody's, everybody's comments are important. Whether I know she was trying to wrap up. When, when you're, Let her finish. Whether you're, whether you're a former trustee or former mayor. Uh, or just you know a, a former board member. Everybody I was asking you to let her finish. The answer is no, Victor. 
Uh, okay, don't let it be. It there. could be a couple seconds. It's okay. It's okay. You're the you're you're the boss. Yes, I am. Thank you, Miss Van Eyck is good next. boss. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm going to read this so I don't skip anything. Uh, for the record, my name is Gina Van Eyck. I am a lifelong resident of the village, and I'm going to go back in time to connect the pieces to today. Until Storm Ida, I had never been a flood victim. That night I watched as a wall of water came from Station Plaza right over the top of the Mamaroneck River towards my house. My husband was almost pulled out of the driveway by the flood waters that reeked of oil, gasoline, and sewage. The rest of the night, I listened to screams for help from men in Columbus Park while waiting for the waters to receive the tide, but they didn't. Until now, I avoided speaking with this board because I had been writing to you for well over a year about the dangers of the storage containers in the floodway, and I was mocked. My concerns were ignored, and your oath to uphold the village code seemed inconvenient. Now it's time to step up. Eight days after Ida, I walked past a crane on Anita Lane, lifting a huge metal container out of the river. It was resting horizontally in front of both channels of the bridge. This was one of two unanchored containers that were permitted in the regulatory floodway in the Van Rance parking lot that yeah, were propelled down the river by raging waters. The yeah. other container lodged vertically in the channel of the Station Plaza Bridge. Even when unobstructed, these are the bridges the Army Corps identifies as being responsible for the back flooding in the village. For one year, I wrote all of you that these were dangerous and in violation of code, and Ida proved me right very sadly. When I questioned the contribution of these containers being lodged in the bridges made that they made to the flood height and the back flooding, Mayor Murphy dismissively wrote, so the container levitated itself into the river before the flood. I suppose resident safety isn't high on the priority list. In addition, the village manager dismissed me in the code when I emailed my concern that a major nor'easter was coming at us and the Van Rance lot could flood. He actually sent an email to the village, not to me, addressing my concern stating, and I quote, the village Mamatic fire inspector and building inspector have been involved every step of the way and following the code, which they weren't. We just didn't tell Gina, I must have forgot, exclamation point. Mr. Barbario, the fire inspector and the building inspector are required to be familiar with and enforce our code. Are we supposed the residents expected to believe that they aren't aware of it? When the containers were fished out of the river, they were placed right back in the floodway, unanchored. A larger storage container, trailers, toilets, tables for the Fuller Center were added to the floodway in the Jefferson Avenue lot in further violation. Federal, state, and local laws require that our, federal, our regulated floodways to be free of development. This is so seriously considered a danger that our chapter 186 provides that any person who violates this article or fails to comply with any of its requirements shall, upon conviction, be fined no more than $250 or imprisoned for not more than 15 days for both, for, or both for each violation, each day of the violation. Will any of the village officials be disciplined or penalized for these egregious violations? Thank God the DEC and the GOS takes our safety and the floodplain code seriously, but that's not the end of my story. It gets much worse. I just became aware that Mr. Barbario filed a discrimination complaint against this village. His EEOC complaint on the village website for the whole world to see bizarrely names me a resident as a party who is colluding to harass him, a public official, for criticizing his job performance during Ida. Not only has Mr. Barbario glibly mocked me in emails, he's also incapable of receiving professional criticism or listening to valid concerns. For someone who represents himself on LinkedIn as a professional municipal manager and operations leader with a litany of degrees and certifications, ignorance of the floodplain statutes is inexcusable. In 2021, the taxpayers paid him $199,777 in exchange for his expertise and professionalism, according to See Through New York that any person could look at. I find it especially disconcerting and frightening when a public officer in a position of power to whom all the departments answer, including the police department, mentally perceives that questioning his job performance is a personal harassment. I blame this board for creating such a hostile environment for residents. And I expect that it is your job to stand up and protect residents like me from further abuses of power. 
That's what I have to say. And I think it's disgraceful that I called you for a year and it was ignored. And those darn things went down the river and they, they added to the back flooding to this village. Take the responsibility for the behavior of these officials. There's my five minutes. Thank you. Uh, the next up is Glenn Tippett, the other popular Mr. Tippett. Glenn? Good evening. Uh, first of all, each and every one of you a happy Valentine's Day. It's a uh, great day to reach out to uh, your loved ones most near and far and just, you know, a reminder of how special they are to you. Number one, uh, <clears throat> we have spring coming up. We have First Amendment auditors. And I just like to let village, uh, village officials and village um, residents know about the legality of photographing in public. Oh, Any American citizen can take a camera, cell phone, device, and they are allowed to either take pictures or photograph anywhere they wish in public. The only restrictions would be a changing room, a bathroom, or in a public building, something that is restricted by sign. I can't go into an unauthorized area in Village Hall. I am certainly allowed in the Voyager. I can't go into a restricted area in the library. Otherwise, I could go through the library. I can go into any public park I want. I can photograph anybody I want. I can take pictures of anybody I want. Anywhere in the park, there is absolutely no restrictions. I can't get within five feet of somebody and get into somebody's face. That would be intrusion of, of, the, of, of privacy. Otherwise, public, public photography is perfectly legal. If you are nervous about the person uh, doing photography, that's fine. You are perfectly allowed to call the police. The only thing the police can do is come down, confront, uh, uh, have a conversation with the photographer. If the photographer does not wish to answer a question by the police and decides not to say a word to him, there is nothing the police officer can do. If the police officer comes down, he said, I'm taking for, uh, photography in public. It's perfectly my right. The police officer goes, well, I'd like to identify you. Kick rocks. Police officer cannot force anybody to identify themselves when they are in a legally lawful pursuit according to the US Constitution. They can turn around and cop speak and say, oh, people are feeling uncomfortable. I wish you wouldn't take pictures here or there or something. That's all, that's all they can do. It is not illegal to take pictures in public anywhere in the village. It doesn't matter if it's Mamaritic Avenue. It doesn't matter if it's a park. You can't go on private ground. You can't go on the school grounds without permission. Mm -hmm. I can't go into South Pizza and do it because that's a, that's a private residence. But as for photographing in public, it's perfectly legal and beyond that, I can photograph in public any place my eyes can see. So even though I'm in public, if I want to stand on the sidewalk and point to Sal's Pizzeria to the guy making the pizzas, that is awful, awfully, that is awful, uh, perfectly legal. Yes. And there's there's not a state, county, yes. local, or uh, or or any agency within the village that could change that. The only way that could be changed, Congress, U.S. Constitution. Number two, really? I've asked this about three or four times. I'm going to make this as simple a, as possible. I would like to see a re resolution that anybody within the flood, floodplain 
that has a single family house and wishes to raise the house out of the floodplain, it can get a variance to match the amount of feet that they're raising the house. If I wish to raise my house seven feet out of the floodplain, I should be able to gain seven feet of height. Therefore, I am not losing two floors, I am losing one floor. If I raise my house 15 feet, I should be able to do. That would be the maximum. We will let you move your house up to 15 feet out of the flood zone. You have to keep your um, original footprint. And if you lower the house, you lose the variance you had when you were able to raise the house. Thank you. Therefore, the only effect that you're having is able to get people out of the flood zone and still own a two family house as opposed to a one family house. Thank, Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for your input tonight. Uh, next item on the agenda is public hearing. Uh, public hearing on PLLK uh, 2021, uh, prohibiting smoking of any substance in uh, Village of Mamaroneck Parks. Uh, I need a motion to open. So moved. Second. Or you call. Trustees Young? Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. The four? Trustee to four? Yes. Victor, we can't hear you. Mayor Murphy? Aye. You got to find a way. Uh, we should maybe call him. Okay. This has been uh, in front of the board before. Uh, this prohibits smoking of any substance in uh, Village of Mamarine Parks. Uh, just to be clear, uh, smoking tobacco was always prohibited in Village of Mamarine Parks. Uh, there was no, uh, the code at the time talked about tobacco. It didn't talk about any other products because I'm sure at the time, uh, the reason for that was marijuana was illegal in any form and, and to be possessed and to be smoked. So it, it, it just seemed redundant to prohibit smoking in uh, village parks, but now the smoking of marijuana is legal. And that's not up for debate tonight. That's New York state law. So what we're doing tonight is we are prohibiting smoking of any subject, including cannabis, uh, which is marijuana, pot, Mary Jane, weed, whatever you kids call it today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, in any village of Mamaroneck Park. Uh, anyone from the public? Mr. Tippett, you want to say something? What are the, all right, go ahead, Glenn. Remember, Tom, it takes them a minute to, for them to unmute me. Okay. Right. You want to pass this law. Uh, a couple of things. Number one, a lot of signage has to be put out there. Harbor Island, you simply don't go into Harbor Island for the front entrance. You, you enter Harbor Island all around the basin. People can walk off the sidewalk into Harbor Island. Number two, does that include the sidewalk adjacent to Harbor Island? That does include any sidewalks to Columbus Park. Does it include the parking lot over by the train station? Exactly wh where do you consider the park beginning and how, and how are you going to have the signage? Three, as policy, you should speak to the police department and basically make this like most of the other laws that you have that nobody enforces them anyway and simply have it as an encounter, you're smoking, please put your device out, put your device out, you're done. You're, you're done. I don't need your identification. You don't wanna turn it into an excuse for Terry stops. Four, the bottom section of this law has to do with disposing of butts and what, whatever garbage may be, uh, creative refuge may be created. It says in designated uh, receptacles only. I didn't know that the village of Amarnik had any dedicated receptacle to dispose of any 
cigarette butt or anything else. You could be, you, you use the public receptacle, make sure that it's out completely, that it doesn't cause a fire. But this state's designated receptacle, and I'm not sure where we have any designated receptacle just to deal with cigarette butts and such items in the village. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your bodies. Hey, good evening. This is uh, James. Body, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, yeah. I just want to piggyback off of Glenn. Uh, pretty much Scarsdale adopted this, and they also uh, no parks, no no smoking of any kind. But it's also on the sidewalks owned by the village, uh, located in any village area. You know, um, any of the parks, because this way you can just walk outside the park and, and and you're able to smoke. So it makes no sense to just say parks, recreation, uh, down the harbor. <clears throat> Glenn is right. You can walk. You can walk on any of the sidewalks into the park. But also our village. I'm, I'm sure we're going to continue with the out, outdoor dining. And, uh, you know, any smoke, especially marijuana, the stench of it alone, um, you know, shouldn't be allowed. Uh, that's just an opinion, but uh, that's what Scarsdale adopted. I think it would be a good idea. Um, they also created it where they don't want it in their streets uh, on the sidewalks because it's the same situation. So it's just a thought. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Have a good evening. Mr. O'Connor. Tim, you're wrong. Yeah, this is Tim O'Connor. Um, yeah, just unmuted. Um, I emailed the village board a little while ago. And so um, I'm not sure if you got received it or not, the email, but uh, I'd like to read it at this point. Um, Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. So, uh, let's see here. February 14, 2022, Mayor Tom Murphy in the village of Amaric Board of Trustees. In regarding to tonight's public hearing regarding PLK 2021, smoking prohibited in village parks, we must expand the village law to include banning of all smoking products on our public sidewalks directly in front of our public parks, school buildings, public buildings, houses of worship, business district, recreation spaces, including fields, parks, and playgrounds, as well as public streets and sidewalks within the village. The obvious is to protect the health and welfare of all village residents and visitors. No exceptions. The village board of trustees must take a strong stance in providing laws that support the residents in a positive way and to continue to improve our quality of life. No smoking of any form in any public area of the village should be the gold standard within the village of Mumarnik. Public outdoor spaces should remain open and accessible to all village residents. Village of Mamaric Board of Trustees need to take advantage of fostering the well being of our residents, health, safety, and welfare of all village residents and visitors. Furthermore, we must keep the quality of life and safety for all our standards as a pri first priority. This cannot be overlooked or compromised. I, I appreciate your time, Mr. Mayor and the board. Take some, take some consideration what we're saying here as the, the as village residents. It's important of this law and I uh, appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, Mrs. Abadi, uh, uh, Laura Abadi, uh, can you let her speak? Go back to the Abadis and... Uh, I'm here. I'm the better here. half. Hi. Hi, it's Laura Body. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Hi, Laura. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm mirroring what everybody else is, is saying, but I do have a couple of questions. I, I think for the benefit of having to piecemeal and add on or subtract, mirroring Scarsdale would be a very good idea because we are not including the sidewalks that are directly butted up against parks, especially within the Washingtonville area. If you're in Armand Genundio Park and an officer comes to enforce you smoking cannabis, 
and that person walks out of our Montanuzio Park six inches, they're on the sidewalk. So we're serving no purpose and we're just moving somebody straight across onto the sidewalk. So it would be good to possibly consider 100 feet from any public area or, or mirroring what Scarsdale's doing to help streamline and keep everything intact because you don't want somebody smoking cannabis in front of bellows when they're picking up their children because it's a public sidewalk and you can smoke pot on that sidewalk. It's something to gravely consider before we keep moving through this law. But this law is greatly appreciated to include lit or unlit as I'm reading in the law, but it doesn't include what the fine would be and how we're gonna impose that fine. I think that's in another section of the law. But I'm not sure. But I, but I, I, didn't, I didn't see it in this law. That, that's why I came came tonight to, to ask that question because when you read the scars of law, it gives you the amount in 60 days. But for us, how are we going to impose that? And better yet, the same situation. If you're in the baseball field on post road and you're watching a child's game and then you move off the grass onto the sidewalk, you're still in the same area smoking cannabis. So we're kind of just pushing it away six inches out of the public park, but right onto the sidewalk in front of the public park. Okay. So it's just something that to consider as a whole across across the whole village. And what Tim's saying, what my husband is saying, I what Mr. Tippett is saying, and what, what I'm sure, you know, the whole entire village who has the same thought process, who didn't have the opportunity to possibly send an email or to get on, on online this evening. It, it, it's something to really consider because if we're going to do it, let's do it once and let's do it right instead of having to just keep going back to this, the, the chopping block, put this to bed at some point and figure it out. I mean, maybe you don't want to adopt every single thing that Scarsdale has, but maybe it's something that we need to consider to, to help be equitable. I don't know if anybody agrees. Or it, it's kind of hard to do this via Zoom because we don't get the opportunity to have banter back and forth and have a conversation. I, I mean, I can't wait for the meetings to go back live so we could actually have real conversations about real things that we need to get done. But I mean, this is something that I feel strongly about because I have my front porch is right on the sidewalk. And if I'm sitting on my front porch and there's six people on my sidewalk smoking cannabis, it affects me and it affects my quality of life. So me times, 35 or maybe 60 people that feel the same way. It's something to consider on, on your public sidewalk or your public street that you own as a village. Thank you. Thank you. Have a happy Valentine's Day, both of you. You too. Uh, anybody on the board have any questions or concerns to the issue? Well, I would say that uh, I, I agree with uh, Laura uh, Abadi that uh, dealing with this piecemeal doesn't solve anything because it's, it's a code that is not enforced already. And we're gonna add another thing to it. And if it makes everybody feel, feel better, that's fine. But um, I, I would like to see a, uh, a review of the actual um, behavior we're trying to prohibit and not just a bunch of uh, um, uh, regulations because right now in the parks, at least at Columbus Park, you've got a proliferation of signs. I mean, it's, I think it's sign pollution. And you can see any one of those signs that behind behind the signs, you will always see at least one prohibited activity happening in the park. And um, so, uh, uh, you know, that's the point I'm trying to make is that people uh, are, are already not paying attention. I'm not suggesting that we uh, we come in like the Gestapo and start enforcing it, but we should adjust it to to uh, uh, to address the behavior we want to control. We, want, we don't want cannabis smoking. We don't want uh, 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 alcoholic beverages. We don't want dog droppings. We don't want littering, those things. Um, but if you want to add this, add it. I don't think it's going to change anything. But I, I think, in my view, yeah. but part of the, the reason you have stuff like this on the books, and it, it, it's not always quantifiable because there isn't tickets written a lot of times because yeah. an officer or a park ranger goes in the park and they see somebody, uh, let's just say prior, yeah. smoking a cigarette, they'll go, hey, you can't smoke it. Yeah. And if the guy puts the cigarette out and doesn't give him a hard time, that's the end of the story. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, if I don't mean to interrupt the mayor, but uh, um, uh, I asked, I didn't foil anything. I just asked uh, Judge Gallagher 
Have you ever seen a ticket for smoking in the park? He goes, never in my whole career here. Right, but, but that goes to my yeah. point. Yeah. That, that, that a lot of time ha- being able to enforce the law yeah. gives you the authority to at least say, put the cigarette out. Well, okay. I, I think it's, I don't think it's good government. If you want to do it. Uh, no, I, uh, I understand you. Know. you. I'm just trying to all. give you my point of view. Okay. I, 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 hear, I hear you. I hear you. Anybody else on the board? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, with, with the, you know, using the logic that it's not enforced, well, then we don't need speed limits. I mean, obviously not everyone gets caught speeding, but we've lowered the speed limit to try and make the streets safer. It's one tool in the toolbox to, to try and do it. And I think um, to, to, to Laura's point, the penalties are at 268 in the bottom of the code. In the code, all that's changing, all we're doing now is taking the, prohibition on cigarette smoking and adding marijuana to it. We're not changing any other aspect of the law. Yeah. So the points that um, that have been made about, you know, maybe you shouldn't be able to smoke anything right outside of a park, that's, that might be something to consider too. But this is a very narrowly focused law that just allows us to treat marijuana the same way we're already treating cigarettes. And, um, and there is a penalty. So, you know, I'm in support of this law. If there wants to be a more holistic review to expand outside the perimeter of the park, that's you know that's a good point. Um, some some states have banned. I mean, Western states don't allow smoking outside at all. New York State didn't make that choice, so people can smoke outside, can smoke marijuana outside. You can't do that in Colorado. So different different states had different approaches, and um, you know maybe we could cut a wider wider swath. But all we're doing now is addressing marijuana in parks the way we've already addressed cigarettes. Any other board member? There's some, someone else from the public and then maybe I come back. Oh, Miss, Miss uh, Yaisa Reed. I didn't see her, the Le- Leona. Leona. Hello, Leona. Hi, um, good evening, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day. Um, I just want to agree with, um, it, 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 I've been going over what's been said with my husband, and um, we just believe that, you know, there's a lot of gray areas with the with the law, and like similar to what Ms. Abadi was saying, and, and as well as Lou, is just if there's, if it can be um, really combed through, and just hoping that in the future that these these laws are not going to target certain communities that is my that's my question like i hope that that's not what what is going on here that you're creating laws to target certain communities um so yes i i'm not for like you know i care about people's health and i care about i believe that you know there should be certain spaces and time and place for everything but if we're going to be ticketing and then um, people being fined, I think you know the law needs to be um, a little bit more clear. And that's all I have to say. Y'all have I, a blessed I, evening. I, I can just tell you, uh, Ms. Reed, from my own uh, point of view, uh, th- there is no intention to target any community that I know it was just the, the genesis of this was we have already prohibited the smoking of cigarettes. Uh, it, it seemed incongruous to then allow the smoking of marijuana in, in the park. So that, to me, that was uh, the, the logic behind this. But I, I could tell you that uh, we will watch how it's enforced. And if it is enforced uh, in, in a way that's discriminatory, uh, it would be our or our, our duty to act upon that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody from the board? Oh, hi. I think Victor wanted to speak. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. I'm not. I'm not opposed to continuing the work, but I think we we've, we've reached a point where we have a clear law that has been questioned whether it, it does what it's supposed to do, and I think it does so. I think we should move forward. Uh, may I, may I say, yeah, sure. Uh, one of the signs at, at Columbus Park says, no organized ball playing on the grass. And although that's what it says, that's not what it means. 
And I think we all know what we're talking about. And that, that's that's the fear I think you heard from Ms. Uh, uh, Yazar, uh, Yazar Reed there. Um, that, that's all, that's all I'm gonna say. Okay. Well, okay, is, is there a motion to close the public hearing? No, we are talking about that. Oh, Dan wants to uh, talk. Dan, go ahead. Why not think that you want to talk? I, I think the comments that have been made by the members of the public are very meaningful, um, but they're very hard to tweak, particularly at this point in time. Uh, if you say not, you know, uh, let's say 100 feet away from the park, um, in some parks that would go into residential buildings and apartment buildings and multifamily buildings. Uh, so I think th th it gets to be a question of trying to define what it is that we want to do. At the moment, it, uh, it talks about in the parks, which I think is important. Uh, and I think that's the first step. I think we may want to go back and revisit if we want to tweak it further, and I think we need to see how it goes, but if you want to tweak it further, then you have to be very careful that we don't get into the law of un unintended consequences of having a prohibition where we can't prohibit. For instance, in Florence Park, it's lined by, ha you know, all around by a fence and houses on the other side. Um, so if you said you'd had to be, you know, even 50 feet away from the park, you would be in the middle of somebody's house. Uh, so you may, it would be from the entrance of the park, but if you say the entrance of the park, then at Harbor Island, uh, I think we commonly refer to the entrance as, you know, at the end of Mernick Avenue. Um, may, that may or may not be the entrance. Uh, I think those are types of things that we're not gonna solve tonight. Uh, but I do agree with Lou, these are types of things that probably should be addressed. And uh, I agree with you, Lou, signage needs to be me meaningful, not just being put up. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I need a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Uh, Augustino just stepped out of the room for a second. <laughs> so uh, I will call the roll. Uh, how do we usually do this? Trustee Young? No. Uh, Trustee Natchez? Yes. Trustee Lucas? Yes. Trustee Tafour? Yes. And I will vote yes. So. Mayor Murphy, I'm happy to call the roll if you need. Uh, you're a day late and a dollar short. <laughs> well, for the, I didn't want to cut you off, but for the adoption. <laughs> Uh, for the adoption, you can call a roll. No, just, that was just the adoption. No, that was just to close the meeting, right? Close the meeting, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, oh, I, I, I should. That's all right. I changed my vote to yes on that. All right, everybody, the unanimous vote to close the meeting. Now, I, I need a motion to adopt the law. So oh, moved. Second. Luda, you can't make the motion. Hmm? You're not going to vote for it. You shouldn't make the motion. You want to make the motion? No. All right. I need, then let, let's start this up. I need a motion to approve the law. So moved. I'll second. Sally, please call the roll. Trustee Young? No. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. Sephora? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Yes. Okay, thank you all. So I guess to move it along, I forgot what we were doing. Okay. Take time. Uh, item 2A. We're almost at the agenda. Uh, is order the bills. Uh, and the first is resolution authorizing amendment for Hurricane Ida overtime. This is taking uh, $48,707 out of uh, appropriated funds balance and putting it into the, the line Ida storm recovery overtime. Uh, and, and I'm sure we made this line so it would be easier to get reimbursed from FEMA. Uh, and that 48,707 to Ida Storm Recovery. Any questions or concerns? I need, need a motion. So move. Second. Sally. Trustee Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? 
Yes. To four. Yes. Mayor Murphy. Aye. Uh, budget resolution 2B. Uh, this is to uh, fund central data processing contract services. So it's taking $41,000 out of contingent and putting it into central uh, data processing service. Uh, Jerry, you want to talk about this for a minute? Uh, Mayor, I'm trying to get Novus to come up because I have an electronic agenda, but maybe Dan can. It's just sure. slow loading up right now. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, there are a couple of items that we needed to purchase for the uh, information technology department, including uh, some uh, uh, licenses for from Dell to establish the village email accounts for the board members <laughs> of the boards and commissions. Uh, and backup and recovery uh, software for a three-year period for uh, VEEAM backup and recovery software. So that's, I think that's uh, the backup and recovery software that uh, we use in case there's a catastrophic failure in our computer system so we can maintain our data and recover. Uh, I need a motion to move that from the contingent to the central data processing. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, just, just a question, if I may. Does any of this have to do with um... Uh, uh, moving forward on municity, it does not. Okay, can you give us anybody give us an update of where we are on that for a timeline and a schedule? Uh, sure. Do I do that, Jerry? No, no. Look, do, send us an email on that. Let, let's move ahead with the agenda. We will. We'll send you an email tomorrow. No problem. Thanks. So I, I need a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Oh, we call roll. Trustees Young. Yes. Natchez. Yes. Lucas. Yes. Before. Yes. Mayor Murphy. Aye. Uh, abstract of uh, manual vouchers tonight is nine thousand sixty-five dollars and twenty-five cents. Questions or concerns? I hear none. I need a motion to approve the manual. So moved. So moved. Second. Okay, Orgy, please. Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. Tafor? Trustee Tafor? Yes. Oh, here you are. Here Mayor Murphy? Aye. Uh, okay. Abstract of audited vouchers uh, 1 million. $992,897.01. Uh, questions or concerns from the board? I have a question on page 13, first item. Ben King of New York, Inc. Get to it. What are we doing monthly on that? Danny King, they clean our offices. Okay. That's Johnny King. Okay. Any other questions? I have a question. Uh, on page nine, yep. uh, litigation from Abraham's Fenstman and Fenstman. Uh, I just want to point out we have uh, McFrory at Flagler, costing the village $4,650. Uh, lawsuits from McFrory Teakert, lawsuits from Teakert. And I just want to point out because I get this question a lot. The Goldstein litigation, that is not the village paying uh, Miss Goldstein's uh, costs as we did during her uh, hearing. Uh, that is uh, the village defending itself from litigation from uh, Miss Goldstein. So I just want to point them out before I get uh, another email. Anybody have? Oh, Glenn has his hand up. Mr. Tippett. Yeah, I have a, a couple of questions uh, on the revenues coming into the village. Um, under uh, Department 0261, we have fines and forfeitures. I see that we're over uh, approximately 800,000. I did a little checking. It seems most of it obviously came after August 29th. Uh, did we have $800,000 worth of insurance recoveries 
against Ida damage. And if we recovered the money through insurance, does, does that have to be minus from what we spent to what we put in for reimbursement for FEMA? Is this on the order of the vouchers that we're talking about? No. Well, the reports are attached to the vouchers. You, you, you have the vouchers and you have the revenue. I know that. We're, 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 talking about approving, no we're, other we're talking about approving, we're talking about approving the order of the bills, but it's fine if, if anybody knows the answer. They okay. can get back to, back to me during the week. And the, the other one is we, um, uh, we received a, uh, a $1.6 million uh, from CHIPS. Is there any um, program currently that we're doing that that's attached to? Thank you. CHIPS is the former stuff that we did two years ago. Okay. So this is to pay for former work. And then we have 448 uh, still left in, in our balance with chips that we can do for, for further work. Correct. Thank you so much. Bye. Uh, I need a motion to approve the abstract of the vouchers. So moved. Second. Augie. Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. Before? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Uh, no old business. Uh, 4A, certificate of unpaid taxes for fiscal year uh, 2021. Uh, this allows us to uh, put liens out on uh, property taxes. Is that right, Rogi? That's correct, Mayor. It's also reconciliation, total collect collection of taxes to date in comparison to what's logged into the village register. And, and I, I, I applaud you on this, Ogie, because when I was with the town, uh, they did foreclosures and it was a much more messier uh, way to get your money back. And, and this works much better. Any questions or concerns? I'll make the motion. Second. Ogie, please. Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. Before? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Uh, the next is the donation of a bench at Harbor Island Park uh, from the Friends of Eddie, are desirous of donating a bench and plaque to the Village of America to be placed at Harbor Island Park in memory of Eddie Piacente, uh, a Piacente. longtime Village of America uh, resident and just an all around good guy. Uh, so that the donation in total is $2,226.50. And we thank the friends of Eddie for their generous gift. I'll make that motion. Second. Old. Trustee Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. The four? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Uh, the next item on the agenda is scheduling budget meetings and hearings. Uh, we added uh, to this agenda uh, February 28th, 4 p.m. Uh, for one hour uh, to talk about uh, aspirational goals of the board in the budget. Uh, and we also uh, went to March 30th, uh, Wednesday, instead of March 31st, Wednesday, March 30th, Wednesday, and we're talking about revenues and expenses on March 30th. And we are moving the Harbor Master and the Parks and Recs to April 12th, 2022. And uh, we'll also talk about other items that are, need to be wrapped up in that meeting. Uh, and I think that those were the amendments that we made at the work session. One, one more, we, we will be taping, you know, we'll right. be keeping this in school. But we might be back in the classroom at that time too. So a but that's a separate issue. I know it's a separate issue. We'll make it available for residents. That's the most I, I understand. I'm just pointing out that we might be back in the classroom. Uh, I'll make that motion. Second. Augustino. Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. The four? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. Uh, 4D, uh, resolution accepting a mural from the Marinick High School. Uh, 
uh, just a quick update on this. The Village of Mamaroneck His uh, uh, Historical Society uh, is looking to save eight murals that uh, were, were made in 1940 in the high school uh, depicting scenes from uh, James Fenimore Cooper's uh, classic American novels. Uh, They're going to be removed because the, the, the uh, high school is building a STEM uh, facility, which is much needed, but the murals are a part of our history. And uh, this, this historical society is trying to save them. They're trying to raise $150,000. Uh, hopefully, if someone's watching and they value history and they value the Village of America history, they can help the uh, his historical society out. Uh, the Village of America has offered to take one mural uh, should this come to fruition and should it should the space be needed, we would house the mural in the uh, Village of America courtroom. Uh, so please get in contact with the Village of America uh, Historical Society. They have a Facebook page and I think they have a, a, a website that you can contact them. Uh, even if uh, this doesn't come to fruition, you should uh, get in touch with our local history. They do a great job of telling the story of Mamari. So I will make the motion uh, that we accept the mural if it uh, comes to fruition uh, to be housed in the courtroom. Second. Augustino. Trustees Young. Yes. Natchez. Yes. Lucas. Yes. The four. Yes. Mayor Murphy. All right. Uh, resolution, uh, I'm sorry, item 4E is a resolution authorizing the sale of a surplus old vehicle. And the vehicle today is a Chevy Suburban uh, with 123,000 123, miles on it. It's a 2005. Uh, so we will, we will auction at a surplus property. Any questions or concerns? Your motion. So moved. Second. Pull the roll, please. Trustees Young. Yes. Natchez. Yes. Lucas. Yes. The four. Yes. Mayor Murphy. Aye. Uh, issuance of an RFP. Uh, this is item. I'm sorry. Four uh, F. Issuance of an RFP for design services for window replacement of a building listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Any questions or concerns? Yeah, my, my only concern, and I'm going to vote for this. My concern is, is that you know we're paying twice what it would cost uh, if it wasn't on the National Register of Historic Places. But it needs to be done, and uh, it, it just, I, 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 it's a lot of money. It's an extra eighty thousand dollars that we're paying for this. But it is what it is. Uh, so I need a motion. So moved. Second. Augustino. Trustees Young. Yes. Natchez. Yes. Lucas. Yes. The four. Victor. Victor, you have to answer. You have to unmute. Yes. yes. Mayor yep. Murphy. Aye. Uh, item 4G. Uh, Resolution authorization to access control system equipment for the Village of America Police Department facilities located at 169 Mount Pleasant Avenue. Uh, we talked about this in work session. Anyone have any questions or concerns? Need a motion? So moved. I'll second. Second. Will we call? Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. Yes. Mayor Murphy. Aye. Uh, Halstead Avenue resolution authorizing engineer design and service for Halstead Avenue reconstruction. Uh, Jerry or Dan, why don't you want to speak briefly to this? Uh, Mayor, this uh, is um, engineering design services for um, uh, almost one mile of Halstead Avenue from Amaranek Avenue to the Harrison line. Uh, full width and full depth restoration as well as all of the required by law improvements, such as um, uh, handicap accessible ADA uh, ramps and um, other items that may come up along the sidewalks and curb. Uh, just a little history. 
There used to be a trolley that ran hmm. that street, and the trolley uh, obviously stopped service before most of us were born, and uh, they, they, they just buried the tracks. Uh, now we're paying the price. And this used to be a county road, and uh, the village took it over during some program that the county had. Uh, and I think I think the county got the better of us on this too. Yep. And that was the infamous, famous Larry Schwartz. May the Schwartz be with you. Uh, so I need a motion. I'll I'll make the motion. Len Len had his hand up, but he's off the call. So oh no, Glenn, he's back. Okay. He had his hand. Glenn, you want to say something about this? Yeah. Um, as they're looking to redesign the road, we have one minor problem uh, that starts uh, one space in on Ward. We have an um, we have an outflow from one of the buildings in the back there that has caused a continual stream of water that goes from Ward Avenue all the way down Halstead Avenue to the drain by Mamarnik Avenue. In fact, when it got cold recently, we've had to put up police tape and we've had to load the uh, sidewalk, even where the sidewalk is cut for the handicap at the crosswalk directly uh, across from the train station. This has been going on for years and years. Every time it gets, it, it gets freezing out, there is nothing but ice from that first space on Ward Avenue all the way down the street on Holstead Avenue until the drain. It's not a leak. Waterworks uh, dug it up. It's not a leak there. They're telling me that there's an outflow pipe somewhere that's putting the water directly on Holstead Avenue. If we're doing Holstead Avenue anyway, this probably should be solved as part of the overall engineering of Holstead Avenue. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. That's a good point. Thank you. I uh, made the motion. Before you do the motion, uh, do we have an update that? Because uh, I know we brought this to the building department's attention. Uh, uh, no, we didn't talk about it. I was at the building department today. I'm there all day tomorrow. I'll talk about. I'll talk to Frank about it. Um, yeah, I I send pictures in during the freeze of the water actually coming okay. of the uh, the sidewalk. Uh, that is tied to a downspout, but it, it's unclear where whether it's coming from the roof in an outlet up there or an outlet down below that's from the first floor. When did you send it last week or, or over the week? No, I sent it weeks ago. Okay. Uh, when, when we had the real cold weather. Okay, I'll, we'll catch up. Frozen. Frozen. Yep. Um, we'll catch up. I sent it to you and I sent it to Dan. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. All right, I made the motion. Second. Second. Okay. Cool. Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Lucas? Yes. Trustee Tafur? Victor? Trustee Tafur, Mayor Murphy? Vote. I vote yes. I just, Tom, I just want to compliment uh, the manager on getting, uh, by bidding out the uh, uh, professional services and getting a significant savings. Thank you, sir. Uh, resolution to execute a grant agreement to develop an open space acquisition plan under the hazard mitigation assistance, uh, building resistant infrastructure community grant program. Uh, Dan, can you give us a real quick? You're, you're muted, Dan. Sure. Uh, it, this is a grant that we applied for in 2020 uh, to conduct an open space acquisition study to uh, protect and uh, hopefully expand some buffers between the Shell Drake River and lands in the industrial area. Thank you. Uh, anybody have any questions or concerns? Okay, someone will make a motion? So, so moved. moved. Second. Paul. Trustees Young? Yes. Natchez? Yes. Trustee Lucas? Yes. Um, Mayor Murphy? Aye. Uh, resolution, uh, home rule request, 
for special legislation to extend a hotel tax in the village of Amatic in support of bills A9110 S8045. Uh, the village of Amatic uh, receives revenue from the two motels located in the community. We get 3% uh, tax, uh, comes to about $20,000 a year, uh, and every little bit helps. Um, so this gives us the opportunity to uh, keep collecting that. Uh, I'll make the motion. Second. Augustino. Trustees Young. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Lucas. Yes. Tafor. Tafor's not here. Uh, he's here. Come on. Uh, Mayor Murphy. Aye. Uh, item 4K, uh, resolution of authorization to pr purchase a MAC 4, no, a MAC LR64R day cab chassis with, with a leech model. <laughs> this is a garbage truck. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he just couldn't put garbage truck. Uh, the, the, the is $312,745 and 80 cents. Uh, it's a very long lead time, about a year and a half, because of uh, holdups in supply. So we need to order it now to get it, and it's replacing a very old truck. And we've had uh, some problems with our trucks. A lot of them had water damage. So uh, consequently, they have been out for repair and you know, uh, constantly need work. So this is a much needed vehicle to the sanitation fleet. Any questions or concerns from the board? No. Yes, Glenn. Yes. Um, I see that our lead time in ordering this type of equipment is, is now extraordinarily long. Uh, if um, they, they wish, uh, Jerry, Dan, any, any uh, heads of the departments might want to look at equipment that normally they might not be planning to uh, get for two years you wouldn't order until next year you might want to move up the ordering process six or eight months because they're not going to see the 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 uh the uh product for two years that way you can get back on your your normal schedule for vehicles thank you thanks Glenn. uh i need a motion to buy the truck so moved second augustino trustee is young yes matches yes Lucas? Yes. Mayor Murphy? Aye. And Trustee Tafour has left the game. All right. Uh, the next up is 4L, funding authorization to make repairs at 169 Mount Pleasant Avenue to fix emergency conditions. Uh, 169 Mount Pleasant Avenue is Actually, it's on Prospect Avenue. That's that's just the address. It is the old village hall where the police department is, the court is, the building department is, uh, and it is in an abysmal state of disrepair. Uh, it 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 needs work. Uh, it needed work thirty years ago, uh, and now it, it's on uh, life support. And we really have to take corrective action. Uh, our employees are working under conditions uh, that they don't deserve. Uh, even uh, prisoners who are arrested for crimes uh, and but you know, still not convicted are being held in conditions that are deplorable. And uh, we have to do something about it post haste. Uh, I commend the village manager for taking an emergency uh, action on this. It has to happen. Uh, the grand total. So the base work is $303,200. The alternate work is $1.7 million and change. Uh, it, it, I, I hate to just drop a big bill like this on people, but you know it has a 20% contingency. But there's a lot of work that's been put off uh, for generations, uh, and you know, I, I have some blame in this too, because you know, I started serving on this board 20 years ago, and uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that you know, it's it's not a uh, an attractive uh, course to in, to take in because you know it doesn't 
bring anybody uh, any joy, but it has to happen. And uh, I apologize uh, that it hadn't happened in uh, the time that I've spent on the board before, but I'm glad it's happening now. Uh, I, you know, yes, Glenn, do you have your hand up again? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, obviously, uh, I have uh, brought this subject up in numerous times, not only over the last months about the uh, uh, initial uh, emergency that uh, Jerry put in like in June, but for 30 years. I realize at this point, you're stuck. You got to you got to pay the over three hundred thousand dollars. My worry is the other one point seven million. Uh, according to our schedule at this point, we're supposed to have an architectural review of that building, and we're supposed to be rebuilding that building next year at a cost of approximately twelve to fifteen million dollars. We can do the all this work. Let me finish, Tom. We can do all this work, but you still have to address the work inside. And at a certain point, you have to become ADA compliant. You can't fix 50, 40 percent of the building. You you do that, you become ADA compliant. You have to put in an elevator. There isn't a hallway in that building that is ADA compliant. There isn't a doorway in that building that's ADA compliant. There isn't an office in that building that's ADA compliant. So I, I have no problems fixing fixing the building, you know, putting the money in and fixing the building. It should have, should have been done months and months ago, and I kept bringing it up. But you just can't say, well, we'll fix this, and then we're going to fix that. You'll be spending more money fixing that building, and eventually it's still not it, – it doesn't serve our purposes. It's too small. The mm -hmm. courtroom is too small. The locker rooms that the police officers use are subpar. Uh, the the uh, the space for lawyers and everything to make think. We have staff over at the um, regatta that if you if you had your druthers, they should all be in one building. We have storage. We're spending forty thousand dollars a year for over at Halstead Avenue. I think that do the repairs, but immediately put a plan together of either building a brand new village hall or being able to, within two years, move move your staff out of this village hall, tear it, tear it, tear it down and build it up right. You can keep the facade, you can keep that, but there, you have a lot of needs that this village hall currently isn't doing and just piecemeal fixing it is not gonna solve the problem and at a certain point, ADA comes in and says, hey, you've, you've done 40% of this building. You have to be compliant now. You're right. No elevators, right, Glenn, small hallways, narrow hallways, small offices. Yes, you made that point. I, I, I understand. And if you remember, uh, years back, I made the suggestion that we knock it down and build what we need there. And I didn't have the support. Uh, but you know, we should have taken remedial action at that time. But nothing that you said is wrong. Uh, but we are where we are today. Yes, Trustee Natchez. Okay. Uh, the, the two, we have two things that are combined into one. One is the emergency work and one is other work that is absolutely needed. Um, and I have no problems with, with both, but I would hope on the non-emergency work, you know, we try and bid it out um, because there were questions that were raised in previous contracts that really have, the contracts were more open-ended than really um, uh, the way I, th you know, th that would might be more appropriate for the village. Uh, and we just asked that, you know, uh, staff and jury uh, use their, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, their uh, approaches and professionalism to try and see if uh, anything can be done that would be more helpful and cost-wise and still get the job done timely. This is for an emergency conditions, and that's that's the resolution in front of us today. Yeah, Mayor, there's a couple of things that Glenn um, said that were a little mm -hmm. off in the fact that um, that 13 million in the capital budget is for a new building, 
yeah. uh, to be built potentially behind and to the side of the existing building. We never had intention of knocking down uh, the current building 169. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, utilize it and continue to, 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 you know, to be um, to have offices in there and, and the police department until the new building was built. Then we were going to move out and create community spaces and other uses from that building. Um, all of this work, uh, including uh, many of the alternates, is to seal up the building. It's to make sure that it, uh, we turn we turn a, a building that has become a sponge now. Uh, into a solid, uh, secure, watertight building, um, which will preserve the building forever so that we can continue to potentially move down our plan, move towards our plan of creating a new village hall around this building and then converting the interior to something that would be uh, more community friendly as opposed to just offices. So right. Glenn was a little off on that. Yes, in Glenn's defense, uh, at one point, and this was uh, before Jerry, uh, you know, before you know, I think the only person on the board was uh, Victor and Nora and I, and it was uh, Leon and uh, Keith Waite. Uh -huh. we, we had the discussion, and, and I did talk about just tearing down that building. Okay. So it, 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 I understand where he got his confusion from. Okay. Yes, Dan. Uh, just a correction, uh, uh, Tom. This is for the entire amount, both the emergency work yeah, I know and, it is. and uh, other desired work. So I've, you know, it's divided into two, and my comments were divided into two. I thank you. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution in front of us. Second. Second. Okay. Call the roll. Trustees Young. Yes. Natchez. Yes. Lucas. Yes. Mayor Murphy. Aye. All right. Oh, that's for the agenda. We got through the agenda? Well, so far. Oh, uh, okay. Second round of comments to the board. Okay. Oh. All right. Glenn. Yes. Oh. Uh, just a, a couple of things. Um, Dan, you did a really nice job um, in the absence of Jerry. And the suspenders, we might have to go with the term dapper for you, buddy. Thanks. Jerry, welcome back. Uh, COVID was tough. I had it, uh, you know, late December, early January. I'm glad that you're feeling better. Worst. It, it was the worst. worst. And uh, finally, in, in, in the uh, spirit of Valentine's Day, if you go to GoFundMe uh, online, there are a couple of hundred of Mamaronic um, uh, residents or businesses that have different GoFundMes that if you so choose, you can help support businesses and residents of the village of Mamaronic. Some of them have to do with the cost of college. Some of them have to do with medical. Some of them have to do with uh, trying to um, put their lives back together from flooding both residential and commercial. We are a very generous village and please feel free, go to the GoFundMe page. Let citizens help citizens. Have a good night. Uh, report from the village manager. Mayor, I have a, a report um, that I want to address the village uh, employees, if I may. In the last few weeks, while I recovered from COVID, it's been on my mind to utilize my time during my village manager's report at the BOT meetings to thank you for all that you did, all you did last year. I know I sent out a few emails thanking everyone already, um, but I want the public to know how much of an effective and caring team we are. I received several emails in the last month that I wanted to read tonight because we're all in this together. I'll try to get through this. Um, never did I expect to take a, on a, a, a new dream job and have to improve and pave $3.6 million worth of roads or start a $5.5 million sewer remediation project under a court order or drive a recovery effort from a tropical storm that knocked out 4,500 village electric customers 50% of our village was without electric, electricity during SIES. 
deal with an almost two year global pandemic, trying to keep staff and their families as safe as possible while working in the community and distributing over 40,000 masks, as well as the rescue and recovery of village residents and businesses from the worst flood in our history, impacting over 30% of our village, causing us, our village government, over 19 million in damage and cost reimbursements. While when people tell me that I'm the best village manager we've ever had, I tell them in fact that I'm the luckiest village manager because I was privileged to adopt and hire some of you to build a strong municipal team. If I am the best, it's only because of you, the employees. There's no doubt in my mind. Thank you all again. As I read these, please remember, we all share in the thanks and praise from these very respected community leaders. This email is from Gerandi Martinez, the executive director from the Community Resource Center. Dear Jerry, I've been meaning to write to you for a while now. After everything that happened with the flood and the way you've handled this situation in the months after, we at the CRC really felt supported by you. The reason we can pump out all of those feats of water in the flats area and in our building is because you made sure to send support and continuously checked on all of us. Members of my team are grateful for your leadership. All I can think about is what a great decision our village trustees made hiring you. Not only were you everywhere, but we felt strongly that you understood every community member in this village. Your humility with our client members we serve is what is most important to us. The feeling of empathy and belonging is truly felt by everyone under your management in the village. For this, your unyielding hard work since the very first day you started and for every single time you stop on your way around the village, we thank you. This letter or this email is from Malcolm Froman, former village of Larchmont trustee and the um, director of the Larchmont Mariner Congo Task Force. Dear Jerry, now that the Larchmont Mariner Congo Task Force has completely moved to the new permanent home at 955 Mariner Avenue, I'd like to express my gratitude for all the thoughtful and reliable support you gave us during our existence. <clears throat> Whenever we needed assistance, you were available to quickly provide a solution. As you know, the pandemic forced us to su suspend our food distribution at the Community Resource Center in March of 2020 in order to ensure the health and safety of clients and volunteers. After opening for four months out of the Mamaronek School, uh, Mamaronek Avenue School parking lot, the start of reopening the schools in August meant we had to leave. Fortunately, you and Tom came to our rescue, giving us the exclusive loose exclusive use of the commuter parking adjacent to Columbus Park. Two indoor locations presented us with, two outdoor, sorry, two outdoor locations presented us with numerous challenges, especially severe weather and a historic flood. But thanks to your commitment to make the resources of the village available to assist us when we needed help, we were able to focus on our mission, providing food assistance for hundreds of struggling Mamaronek families. Thanks to you, I've gotten to know many of Mamaronek's key personnel, Chief Sandra DeRusa, and before her, Chris Le Leahy, Building Inspector Frank Tavalaki, General Foreman Tony Acavelli, and Recreation Supervisor Jason Pinto, among others. Each of them has provided the Hunger Task Force with invaluable assistance. Jerry, as you know, I am a trustee. I was a trustee of the village of Larchmont for five years. During that time, I became keenly aware of the critical role of village manager in Larchmont, it's a village administrator, plays to providing a reliable, safe, and pleasant environment. The residents of the village are in good hands. On behalf of the many volunteers, and especially the hundreds of families we serve, we want to thank you for your unwavering support. And Mayor, this uh, last email is from Margaret Calford, President of the STEM Alliance and a village of Mamaronek resident. Dear Jerry, it was great to see you at the Westchester Assembly Delegates State Budget Hearing last week. You were one of only a handful of local administrators who came to this important event to represent the financial needs of our community. You were extremely eloquent. I was surprised at that too. 
and clear about the critical need for the financial support in the areas of affordable housing in the county overall, but more specifically here in the village of Mamaroneck. You made it clear that diversity, that the diversity that defines us here in the village of Mamaroneck is at risk and that the lives of our residents will be impacted if state level leadership does not identify and assist with the organizational, organizationalism of available funding. The delegates were impressed and asked you to collaborate with the leaders, um, the other leaders from the small municipalities to help clarify the path that is needed to assist local communities and localities such as ours. With your natural, let's get it done together approach, you immediately agree. Watching you speak with passion and authenticity, as well as the clear knowledge of how to level available resources for the goods of the residents, I was immediately reminded of your 24 seven response to the flooding crisis in September, 2021. Jerry, I'm not certain enough of us have thanked you for your exceptional dedication to our community, but you gave us so much more than overtime hours in September, although you certainly gave us plenty of those as well. You combined compassion with managerial skills, governmental knowledge of law and policy, as well as respectful engagement of the local volunteers and nonprofit groups to craft evolving solutions for each stage of the disaster. This was not just about the initial days when people needed, um, when people needed help the most. Um, you have been dedicated for months after the disaster and recovery needs. Your skills are exceptional and this cannot be understated. Thank you for your commitment to the village of Mamaroneck. We're a better place thanks to your leadership now and in the future. So Mayor, all of those letters um, are extremely heartwarming and uh, <clears throat> humbling, um, but they are letters not to, just to Jerry, but they are letters to the village employees as a whole. Uh, none of the stuff that I do uh, could I do alone, none of it. Um, and every single department head, as well as every single employee are always available for me um, to be able to do some of the things that these well-respected leaders uh, uh, in our community uh, describe in their letters. So I appreciate the time that you've afforded me this evening. And I wanna thank you. I have three items that are for the record. Um, I can't remember what they are. Let me look them up. Sport time, time contract, sport yeah. We got the trees and the Millennium Strategies. Thank you very much for your time. Jerry, uh, thank you for sharing those letters. Uh, I enjoyed reading them when I came in. Uh, how you can assess people is how they behave under moments of extreme stress and extreme danger. And I have watched you up close in many of those situations. And while the employees certainly deserve a ton of respect and gratitude, yeah, uh, you were the quarterback of the team. And you know, you, no team wins without a quarterback who can call the plays. And you did that magnificently when the chips were down. And uh, you know, I, I think I spent 12 straight days with you after the flood. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know, it was the village of Mamaroneck in Toto's finest hour. And uh, I think that all three of those well-respected uh, community members recognize that too. And you know, it, you, you've seen tonight. You know, uh, the, there's the two sides of the coin. And uh, I, I'm constantly reminded in public service of the poem by Rudyard Kipling called "If," uh, where you assess both sides of the coin. And uh, I, I think it, it, if, if you read it, uh, it, it's a good thing for every elected or appointed person who serves in government to read and understand, because uh, it, 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 uh, it's about how you deal with adversity. Uh, so thank you and thank our employees for a magnificent job in times of extreme, extreme stress. Thank you and thank them. They're awesome. Hey, Jerry. Uh, next up is the ever popular and great employee also, Mr. Fusco. Yeah. Hey, uh, please be advised you'll be a texting sale on March 9th, 2022 at 10 a.m. in the courtroom at 169 Mount Pleasant Avenue. That is all, Mayor. Thank you, sir.
Now a report from uh, the ex-appellate judge, uh, Mr. Sposino, who we're lucky to have. Thank you, Mayor. My report is only that Local Law 1 of 2022, which was the local law establishing the special floods hazard areas, was filed and became effective on January 24th. Uh, minutes, commissions, boards, and committees, minutes of the Board of Trustees work session and regular meeting of January 24th, 2022. Minutes of the Budget Committee meeting of January 5th, 2022. Minutes of the Flood Mitigation Advisory Committee meeting of October 26, 2021. Uh, minutes of the Planning Board meeting of December 22nd, 2021. Minutes of the Tree Committee meeting of December 9th, 2021. Minutes of the Committee for the Environment meeting of December 21st, 2021. Minutes of the Art Council meeting of January 4th, 2022. Uh, before we adjourn tonight, I just want to reiterate that I hope everybody has a great Valentine's Day. You might see here on the table arrayed uh, 24 beautiful roses. Uh, that was a gift to the mayor. Uh, the first time the mayor has ever received flowers from anyone in his life. And I, I want to thank uh, the lovely uh, Joe Jason for sending them to me. Uh, you, you, you made my day, sweetheart. I appreciate it. Uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor of saying good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, we got through that. Yeah. So, so what now? Still recording.